Singla, Marketing Head Sun Pharma, Stand Life Division. I take this opportunity to welcome each one of you for the second session of Rhinology Mega Master Class. Rhinology Mega Master Class is an ongoing uh, uh, initiative to discuss the recent updates in the field of Rhinology. And uh, now I take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Goro Medikari who conceptualized this uh, idea and uh, uh, associated with us to help us, uh, associated with us and uh, to execute this uh, program for not, not only for Indian doctor, but across the globe. So it's a matter of great pride and opportunity for all of us that this program is being viewed not only by Indian doctors, it's been viewed by uh, all the global doctors. So uh, not wasting a lot of time, uh, I uh, invite Dr. Gaurav Medikari uh, to take the session forward. Dr. Gaurav Medikari is MS ENT. He is a consultant rhinologist, medical super specialty ENT center, global clinical and research lead, skull based ENT, SCG group of hospitals, program director, uh, skull based fellowship, SCG hospital. Uh, Dr. Gaurav Medikari is trained fellowship in uh, uh, and uh, fellowship in rhinology and anterior skull based surgery went over Canada. Fellowship in rhinology and skull based surgery Liverpool UK, and he has done his fellowship in rhinology, rhinoplasty, and facial cosmetic surgery Seaman Rhinoplasty Clinic, Seoul, uh, Korea. Uh, Dr. Gora Medikari is a founder trustee Medi uh, of uh, Medikari ENT Research Institute, uh, Institute Trust. So uh, this program is uh, is a part of our commitment uh, to serve ENT class and. Uh, and we are serving this ENT uh, fraternity with the range of our product like box left, uh, Refzilo, uh, kind of product we are sharing. And uh, with this, I invite Dr. Medikari to uh, kick roll this, uh, the second session of uh, uh, Rhinology me uh, Mega Masterclass. Over to Dr. Gora Medikari. Thank you so much for the introduction. I would like to uh, introduce our uh, guest of honor today, that would be Dr. Sarah Weiss. Uh, she's a professor at uh, Emory uh, University. She's a very well-known name in the field of immunology, rhinology, and sinus surgery. Uh, today, we have our moderator with us, Dr. Lakshmi Satish, who is a very well-known practitioner from Bangalore. She's been a, a pillar of support for us as well for this uh, event. Uh, so she's been a senior practitioner for, the, uh, practitioner for the last 25 to 30 years in Bangalore itself. Thank you so much for joining us, ma'am. Without uh, wasting any more time, I would request Dr. Sarah Weiss to kindly uh, start her lecture, if she wouldn't mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is my absolute honor and pleasure to have been invited to speak to everyone today. Um, I have enjoyed getting to know uh, a few of you, and I hope to get to know many more of you uh, over the, the next uh, days, months, and years. Uh, as Dr. Medicare said, I am a professor at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, with a spe specialization in rhinology and uh, allergy. And today I have been asked to speak on um, additional testing in uh, chronic rhinosinusitis. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start to share my screen. I'm hopeful that everyone can see my screen now. Um, please uh, let me know if there are any issues with um, viewing the slides or with hearing me at any time. And as I understand, we have approximately an hour for this session, uh, and I will certainly try to leave um, several minutes for questions at the end. Um, So these are um, some of the financial disclosures and relationships that I have with, with companies. Um, I do not believe that any of these will be uh, particularly relevant to my talk today. I also have included my email address uh, in the event that anyone has questions that result from this lecture. I'm happy to hear from any of you at any time. And uh, again, I'm, I'm very honored to go ahead and give this lecture. So today, we're going to talk about various things. Um, we'll start with a discussion of um, after we obtain a history and physical exam in a patient with rhinosinusitis, 
or rhinitis, what may prompt additional testing based on some of the clues that we get in our history and physical examination. Um, we'll also discuss, uh, at least in brief, what some of the types of allergy testing are and what clinical situation would prompt the use of these different types of testing. Uh, and I will note that we're going to have an additional session on allergy in uh, chronic rhinosinusitis on the 2nd of October. And so I would encourage uh, people to attend that one as well. We'll also discuss a little bit about nasal smears in differentiating rhinitis and um, some uses for blood work in chronic rhinosinusitis. And we'll end with a discussion of um, tissue biopsy and histopathology in CRS. So first, uh, for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to say that additional testing refers to allergy evaluation, blood work, um, and nasal histology or biopsy, as I was indicating before. We'll assume that most um, chronic rhinosinusitis patients will have endoscopy, physical examination, uh, history taking, and likely CT scan. And so these are not going to be considered additional testing. I'm also not going to be discussing cultures or microbiological assessments um, in this discussion. So I do wanna say that there are certain situations where patients do not require additional testing in CRS. And I've shown a few examples of these here. Uh, for example, odontogenic sinusitis, um, so relation to uh, dental pathology, a standard fungus ball, and then um, mucosil. Um, as long as these issues are uncomplicated, uh, typically patients will not require additional testing for diagnosis or treatment of these heart conditions. However, there are several entities within the inflammatory CRS realm that uh, do require additional testing or where additional testing may be helpful. So when we suspect uh, these various conditions, uh, as I've listed here, things like immune deficiency, AERD, aspirin, or uh, NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease, the potential contribution of allergy, um, the consideration of biologic therapies, especially in TH2 mediated disease, um, cystic fibrosis, ciliary dyskinesias, and then considerations of inflammatory conditions like sarcoidosis or um, vasculitis. So a number of these um, may require some additional testing of various types. We also have to keep in mind when we're evaluating patients with sinonasal conditions that on occasion we may identify tumors, meningoencephalocele,s or other non-inflammatory entities. Um, we're not going to talk about or discuss those, but um, these things should be considered and remain in the differential diagnosis as they will be found on occasion. So we'll start by uh, a brief discussion of what prompts additional testing based on some of the clues that we get in our history and physical examination. And we're gonna dive a little bit more into the specific tests um, later. But um, starting with immune deficiency, for example, these patients will often present with recurrent sinusitis that uh, oftentimes quickly recurs after completion of a course of antibiotics. They may have infections of other um, respiratory and associated areas, such as the lungs or the middle ears. And some of the things that we can consider in these patients are things like immunoglobulin levels and possibly subclasses, as well as vaccine responses, including pre and post antibody titers. At times, these patients uh, will require a consultation with our immunology colleagues as well for additional workup and treatment. When we're considering um, aspirin or NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease, these patients typically are going to have nasal polyps on examination, asthma, and respiratory reactions to those particular drugs. The respiratory reactions may be um, nasal in nature with increased congestion and mucus, or they can be uh, lower respiratory with wheezing and uh, bronchospasm. 
Some of these patients um, who consume alcoholic beverages may also report some reactivity to, uh, to the alcohol when it's ingested um, to, with a typical respiratory reaction as I described. And this is thought uh, to be due to some of the polyphenols that are present in the alcoholic beverages, especially in wine. Um, so that can be a, a potential clue as well. And I've listed to the right a few of the tests that we may consider to, um, getting in these patients. Uh, eosinophils, um, urine leukotriene, uh, sorry, urine LTE4, and uh, potentially aspirin challenges. And we'll talk a little bit more about those later. If we are considering an allergy contribution, certain subtypes of CRS, like allergic fungal rhinosinusitis or central compartment atopic disease, um, may prompt allergy testing as those entities have been distinctly associated with uh, allergic phenotypes. If patients have environmental triggers or seasonal symptoms, we may consider allergy testing as well. And that allergy testing can come in the form of skin or in vitro testing. And we'll talk about some of those uh, options for allergy testing shortly. TH2 mediated disease is often um, associated with eosinophils in the blood and the tissue. And uh, when we're considering patients for possible biologic therapy for uh, polyposis or potentially for uh, asthma or urticaria, um, some of the biologics will require assessment of eosinophil levels or IgE levels. Um, these can also be helpful for us to predict patients' tendency towards recurrence um, or recidivism of their disease. Our typical TH2 patient is going to have polyps or polypoid disease um, within the sinonasal cavity, uh, although that's not necessarily required. A lot of these patients will have asthma and uh, potentially a history of atopic disease. Things like cystic fibrosis can also occur. Um, and can even be diagnosed late. Um, I have been involved in the diagnosis of patients uh, up to the age of um, 50 or beyond. So just because it's not diagnosed in childhood doesn't mean that it can't happen. Um, these patients will often have chronic or recurrent CRS symptoms with um, thick mucus, uh, possibly polyps or polypoid disease in a significant number of these patients, and then pulmonary and GI symptoms uh, especially issues with um, vitamin absorption. The test that we will typically run will be sweat chloride, um, which will be increased in the CF population, um, as well as potentially genetic evaluations. Ciliary dyskinesias can also present in a similar matter with a uh, similar manner with uh, chronic or recurrent sinusitis, pulmonary symptoms, or bronchiectasis. And these patients will oftentimes have middle ear disease as well. If they have Cartagener syndrome, then situs inversus is uh, also seen. Ciliary structure and function studies uh, are often obtained and genetic evaluation can be done as well. There have been approximately 32 genes associated with uh, ciliary dyskinesia. And in these patients, nasal nitric oxide is decreased. Finally, um, some of the inflammatory conditions can be considered things like vasculitis, uh, such as GPA, is often seen in patients with rhinitis, sinusitis, epistaxis, septal perforation, um, and these patients can have systemic involvement as well. The most classic tests performed is going to be are going to be those of the ANCA um, variety, and on biopsy we'll see um, vasculitis. Granulomatous disease or sarcoidosis can also be seen, and these patients often present with rhinitis, sinusitis, and systemic involvement. And the classic um, laboratory test is going to be an ACE level. Biopsy will reveal non-caseating granulomas. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about each of these later. For the moment, though, I'm going to move on to consideration of allergy testing. So uh, we'll have a brief review of some of the different types of allergy testing. And again, in early October, um, we'll go into this a little bit more. So when would we consider allergy testing? When we're suspicious of some type of type one IgE mediated disease. So within patients with chronic rhinosinusitis, this will be patients uh, that have 
subtypes like AFRS or central compartment disease. Sometimes uh, patients with AERD, especially those with central compartment involvement, will have significant allergy component. And then certainly those patients with classic allergy symptoms. We are not going to wanna to do skin testing in patients that are on medications that would interfere with testing or with our treatment of anaphylaxis. And some of those are listed here. Uh, you can also find references to um, lots of these specific medications and exactly how long they need to be discontinued. If patients have uncontrolled asthma, they are at higher risk of death from anaphylaxis. So in the rare event that a patient has an anaphylactic reaction on skin testing, um, there has been an association with uh, uh, increased risk of death if their asthma is uncontrolled. So we don't wanna be doing skin testing in patients with uncontrolled asthma. And then if patients have dermatographism or other physical manifestations of urticaria on the skin where it would make it difficult to interpret their skin tests, we won't wanna do a skin test in those patients. So when our history gives us clues to the potential for allergy, we can do testing to confirm that diagnosis and to identify clinically significant allergens as well as to determine the degree of sensitivity. There are various types of skin testing, skin prick, intradermal, or blended techniques, and we'll touch on br briefly on each of those. So why do we test the skin? Because mast cells reside in the subepithelial layer of the skin, and when an allergen is presented to a sensitized mast cell, that reaction leads to the release of mediators, and that allows us to see that wheel, which is the edema, and the flare, which is the air thema that surrounds it on the skin. So this is really an indirect measure of cutaneous mast cell reactivity due to the presence of specific IgE. So here in this diagram um, from Nature Medicine, on the left, we can actually see initial presentation of antigen and the formation of that specific IgE. When an antigen is represented, that specific IgE is available to react to that antigen and cause um, degranulation of the mast cell, which we can see uh, in a little bit larger picture here. And subsequently, mediators like histamine are released. So this is the reaction that we're looking for in the skin. So the wheel occurs after a short time. Um, the skin begins to swell because there's increased vascular permeability and um, a corresponding influx of water. And that actual swelling or the wheel response is proportional to the amount of mast cell degranulation. So uh, it basically gives you um, a sense of, of how much mediator is being released. These mediators also trigger sensory nerves and contribute to that itching and erythema. So with skin prick testing, um, this is a, a typically done with a device with a small sharp point um, that pricks just the superficial layer of skin. It's very quick. It can be used in pediatric patients. It's not an actual needle in injection. Um, it gives you basically a positive or negative response. It's not really used for quantitative analysis of the amount of sensitivity. Um, and if skin prick testing results are used to determine immunotherapy mixes, um, patients will be started at the same level um, based on the skin prick test and work up from there. So when skin prick testing is done, we'll use an antigen concentrate that's pricked into the skin and then read that wheel diameter. So this, the swelling, um, not the redness um, in this particular type of testing, we'll read the wheel diameter at 15 to 20 minutes. And if that wheel diameter is greater than three millimeters larger than the negative control, that's a significant reaction and considered, considered positive. It's important then that we use positive and negative controls to ensure that we're getting appropriate reactivity. So this is what a multi-test device looks like, this little device here, and it's dipped into these wells of antigen concentrate and then pricked onto the skin. And after the initial pricks, you can see the area that the um, device went into and the small amount of antigen concentrate that's 
located there and allowed to seep into the skin. And then eventually we will get um, what looks like this. So the wheel is that swelling or the welt that comes up. The flare is the erythema. And then occasionally um, with significant reactivity, we'll get a little growth out from the wheel that's called a pseudopod. And it's the diameter of the wheel that you'll want to measure in order to get the, um, a sense of whether it's positive or negative compared to the control. We can also do skin intradermal te dilutional testing, um, which is a bit more labor intensive. These are actual intradermal injections with a small needle under the skin. It takes a bit of time to do because you are progressively working up from the lowest concentration to higher concentrations to get uh, detailed quantitative data um, and an assessment of how reactive the patient is. So this is more quantitative than skin prick testing. It's not uh, simply a positive or negative assessment. And these are some of the dilutions that can potentially be used. Um, so you can see that your least concentrated uh, dilution is, is quite dilute um, and you can work up from there. These are five fold dilutions from an antigen concentrate. So when we do this type of testing, we put the, the least concentrated um, injection first and raise uh, an initial wheel that measures about five millimeters. And then after um, intervals of 10 minutes, continue to work up progressively to more concentrated injections. And eventually if the patient is reactive, they'll have a swelling of the wheel. And if the, if the wheel grows two millimeters or more, that's considered a positive reaction. And then we'll typically place one more just to confirm that that is a true reaction. There are also blended techniques. Um, one of them is called modified quantitative testing. And this is a combination of a skin prick test followed by a single intradermal test that allows um, improved quantification of the reactivity beyond the initial skin prick test. Um, and this is just an example protocol of that that um, essentially says that depending on the size of the wheel that's, um, that's, that results from the skin prick test, you then move on to the intradermal test of a specific uh, dilution in order to better quantify that reactivity. The final option for allergy, uh, skin, for allergy testing is in vitro serum testing. And this is where we uh, basically test serum levels of IgE for specific inhalant allergens. And the result of this is given in what's called classes. And that is a measure of quantitative specific IgE. This does correlate well with skin testing, but it's a bit, a bit less sensitive. So um, typically we recommend skin testing for our patients, but if they are on uh, medications that they are unable to discontinue that may interfere, um, or if they have some of those uh, physical urticarias or dermatographism, severe or un uncontrolled asthma, uh, or needle phobia, or simply don't desire to undergo skin testing, they can certainly have in vitro testing as an option. The last thing I'll say about uh, allergy testing is that it is very important to remember that um, we need to correlate our test results with the patient's symptoms. So if we get a positive test, that indicates that the patient is sensitized or atopic. Allergy is not just sensitization, um, but it is clinical symptoms that have been confirmed by a positive test. So we wanna take those positive test results and go back to our history uh, and make sure that what we're seeing on our test correlates with the patient's actual symptoms. If they have a positive test, but no symptoms to that particular allergen, then they're not allergic. Um, allergy is based on symptoms. So in um, chronic rhinosinusitis, when we're considering an allergy contribution, there are certain things that prompt me to suggest allergy testing to my patients. So patients with uh, typical findings of allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, and we'll look at these here in just a moment, 
or central compartment atopic disease, which is an entity that our group, along with uh, the group in Sydney, Australia, described uh, a few years back. As I mentioned before, if they have aspirin sensitivity with central compartment involvement, um, environmental symptoms or triggers, and then uh, possibly patients with Th2 mediated disease. So allergic fungal rhinosinusitis uh, is classically defined by the five criteria that I've listed here to the left. These were uh, written by Benton Q, 1994. And you can see that type one IgE mediated hypersensitivity typically to fungus is the number one uh, criteria that's. And the other criteria involve things like nasal polyposis, CT, characteristic CT scan findings, and then some pathologic criteria. And we'll be diving uh, much deeper into this in, during my lecture in October. Central compartment atopic disease, uh, as I mentioned, is an entity that's highly associated with atopic status. It, is, it includes polypoid changes of the middle turbinate, superior turbinate, and the posterior aspects of the nasal septum. And this is basic where, basically where the allergens flow um, during our inspiration through the nasal cavity. On CT, we typically see the central opacification of the nasal cavity, and then we have clearing around that, oftentimes with uh, what has been described as a black halo. So the um, superior and lateral aspects of the ethmoid cavity, as well as the maxillary sinuses, are often left without disease. Uh, and this, in later stages, can progress uh, into the sinuses to involve the sinuses, and that's typically due to lateralization of the middle turbinate causing obstruction and uh, edema. This is a Th2 con mediated condition with lots of eosinophils seen on pathology. As I mentioned before, we have noted that um, some patients with uh, AERD can have associated allergy and, and that's often seen when they have that central compartment involvement. We did study the prevalence of allergy amongst various subtypes of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. And not surprisingly, AFRS and CCAD were noted to have the highest prevalence of allergy. Um, and then a lot, a lot of the um, entities had significantly more allergy than our standard CRS with nasal polyposis that, ha that is uh, not otherwise specified. So as I mentioned, please tune in on October 2nd for an expanded discussion of allergy and CRS and its associated subtypes. Um, just a gentle reminder for up an upcoming webinar. So um, in consideration of other rhinitis entities, we'll talk a little bit about nasal cytology. And I just want to highlight this particular article, which I found to be a great reference in reviewing techniques for nasal cytology, uh, for obtaining um, specimens for nasal cytology, interpretation, and some of the clinical implications of um, the findings that, that are evident on nasal cytology. Um, and this is also discussed in the EPOS 2020 document as well. So um, this is just a, a brief rundown of some of the co different collection methods, how they're, they're actually done, and then some of the things that can be measured um, with nasal cytology. So it's possible to just blow the nose into a container or a tissue, um, use a lavage, use a sterile suctioning device. Um, some people have used pieces of nasal packing or sponges that are placed in certain locations, such as adjacent to the inferior or middle turbinate, um, and then nasal brushing or scraping. And it seems that nasal brushing and scraping are probably the best um, for the actual cytology evaluation, although some of these other methods have been used to measure inflammatory mediators. So for nasal cytology, um, something like a brush or a rhinoprobe is often used. And then the classic stain that is described is this May Grunwald Gemsa stain. That identifies lots of different things, inflammatory cells, mucosal cells, um, even some of the microorganisms that may be present. Um, and then typically it's optical microscopy that's used in order to evaluate the cells and, and other elements. 
And this is just an example of some of the grading of nasal cytology that has been uh, proposed and used um, in order to grade things like um, epithelial cells, mucinous cells, various inflammatory cells, et cetera. Just some quick uh, photos to show what some of the examples of nasal cytology can demonstrate. Um, so on the left, you can see nasal mucosa um, as, as well as some different types of cells, goblet cells, basal cells, et cetera. On the right, you can see an example of bacterial rhinosinusitis with um, actually showing the microorganisms that are present along with the, um, the associated uh, inflammatory and um, mucosal cells. Here up at the top right, we can also see an example of allergic rhinitis and some of the cells that are evident uh, in that particular disease process. So on, in this panel B, we can see a degranulating mast cell as well as a couple of degranulating eosinophils as well. Down in the lower left, we can see some examples of non-allergic rhinitis, such as um, NARES or non-allergic rhinitis with eosinophilia, as well as um, non-allergic rhinitis with mast cells and neutrophils. So um, in allergic rhinitis on nasal cytology, we typically see eosinophils as the predominant uh, inflammatory cell type followed by mast cells and basophils. And we saw that in the example in the previous slide. The uh, entity NARES or non-allergic rhinitis with eosinophilia syndrome is a, a perennial rhinitis with a negative allergy skin test that also has eosinophils on nasal secretions. Uh, and then there are various other types of non-allergic rhinitis with associated inflammatory cells like mast cells, neutrophils, um, and then some combinations. It has, uh, there have been several studies um, primarily done by this um, group that, uh, that were associated with the paper that I highlighted before, basically showing that uh, there tend to be very high numbers of eosinophils in uh, allergic rhinitis, as well as uh, mast cells, as I mentioned before. With regard to uh, things like biopsies or actual uh, obtaining of tissue specimens, this is not something that is classically done in, in uh, the workup of rhinitis. However, historically, it has allowed some characterization of inflammatory cells in this uh, disease process. When we compare nasal cytology versus histology, um, it has been written that the secretions and the mucosa represent two distinct compartments, and we can definitely see infl inflammatory cell um, changes in secretions following antigen challenge. With regard to CRS, uh, when we look at nasal cytology or histology, just a couple of comments about how this um, may help to predict um, outcomes or um, surgical decisions. So higher eosinophils and mast cells can potentially predict polyp recurrence after endoscopic sinus surgery has also been associated with a higher rate of revision and may suggest a need for a more aggressive or radical surgical approach. approach. And I think this is something that we're seeing adopted a bit uh, more in that um, initially led by the, the groups in Australia um, and now being adopted uh, by several other centers around the world that when we see patients with an eosinophilic phenotype, uh, a bit more aggressive um, or uh, larger surgical openings have been advocated in order to reduce the tendency towards recurrence. I do want to take a moment to mention that several medications may have an effect on nasal smears, um, things like antihistamines, steroids, antileukotrienes, uh, may reduce the level of especially eosinophils and some of the other subtypes. And I think this is something we need to keep in mind if we start taking these medications um, around the time when, when if you're doing a new or, site or um, 
uh, biopsy, it may reduce the number of inflammatory cells that you're able to see. We'll now move on to a bit of discussion about blood work specifically and when we might consider that in our CRS patients. So um, there are a few entities that if you're suspicious of these things, you, it may prompt you to get some blood work or other testing. And the first of those is consideration of immune deficiency. And I suggested previously that uh, we may consider an immune deficient state in patients that have recurrent sinusitis, especially if it's quickly recurrent after the discontinuation of antibiotic therapy, and if they have lower respiratory infections or possibly um, ear infections as well. And the most common immune deficiency from a serologic standpoint is gonna be IgA deficiency, um, which is, it, it has been reported to be fairly common between one in 173 and one in 3,000 or so patients. And this predisposes to rhinosinusitis and interestingly to atopic diseases as well. So if there is a suspicion of an immune deficiency, um, we can have uh, immunoglobulin assessment via serologic testing. And we're gonna be especially interested in IgA and IgG levels. There is some controversy about whether subclasses should be measured, um, but some people still do advocate it. We can also consider measurement of vaccine responses. Um, and in these particular cases, it's recommended to immunize with um, a protein antigen, such as tetanus toxoid and a polysaccharide antigen like pneumococcus, and ensure that pre and post immunization antibody titers to these, um, these items are obtained. And then uh, we typically want to see an appropriate rise in, in the titers in order to uh, evaluate for an appropriate immune response. And there are some guidelines around that if you're interested in doing that in your, uh, in your clinic. We also may consider immune, immunologist referral uh, for additional workup or if there are potentially cell-mediated immune deficiencies considered uh, or things like that. When we think about markers of Th2 inflammatory profiles and especially consideration of biologic therapy, we may end up getting some blood work as well. So um, we have recently seen obviously uh, an, an incredible interest in biologic therapy uh, in the US and around the world. Here in the US, we have approval for one biologic, Dupixent, uh, in chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis at this time. Um, and that is a uh, um, IL-4 alpha receptor blocker, which has an effect on both IL-4 and IL-13. And it is very likely that we will see some additional biologics approved for nasal polyposis in the future. And many of these are things that are already in use in asthma, things like omalizumab or benralizumab. So, um, Especially in the asthma population, there are um, certain markers in the blood that can uh, that are used to determine if patients are candidates for some of these biologics, things like eosinophil levels and total IgE. Um, and it's important to note that um, blood eosinophil level can correlate with um, Lundmachai CT score and endoscopy score in CRS with polyps. Um, some specialized centers will also test for periostin. Uh, this is a, a marker that has been evident in various eosinophilic conditions, such as asthma, and does also correlate with Len Mackay CT scores. If we're considering um, some of the vasculitis entities, again, um, something like GPA, uh, formerly known as Wegner's granulomatosis, is often associated with rhinitis, sinusitis, and septal perforation, as well as epistaxis. And um, one of the tests that is often ordered is a, an ANCA level, uh, specifically C ANCA. Interestingly, it may be negative if the disease is limited to the sinonasal region. And um, nasal biopsy, while it can be helpful if it's positive for vasculitis, um, it may not be diagnostic. Also eosinophilic 
um, granulomatosis with polyangiitis is a necrotizing vasculitis of small to medium-sized vessels. And this is typically associated with adult onset asthma, nasal polyps, eosinophilia, and sometimes middle ear disease. So um, a few words about ANCA. So this is uh, autoantibodies that are primarily IgE against the cytoplasm of neutrophils and monocytes. Um, and in uh, patients with GPA, uh, formerly Wegner's, uh, now called GPA, C. ANCA is present in about um, 80 to 90 percent of patients. In patients with eGPA, it can be present in about 35 percent, uh, and P. ANCA is also present in about 35 percent. Important to note, um, and this is something that I've had come up uh, recently in my practice, in patients that use intranasal cocaine, um, sometimes the ANCA levels will end up to be positive. And this can be a little bit confusing because patients are presenting with, uh, oftentimes with rhinitis, septal perforation, um, and uh, destruction in the nose, as well as epistaxis. Um, and we can potentially start going down the road of GPA diagnosis uh, if the patient is not forthright with their uh, admission of cocaine use. Uh, finally, in consideration of sarcoidosis, um, this is a non-caseating granuloma. Oftentimes, we can actually see small um, bumps in the nasal mucosa and have a suspicion of uh, sarcoidosis. The classic serum test that's obtained is an angiotensin converting enzyme. And this is usually more likely to be positive if there's multi-organ involvement or aggressive disease. Sometimes if it's just limited to the nasal cavity, it will be negative. Um, and I have certainly had a situation like this where the ACE level is negative and ultimately the patient was diagnosed with um, sarcoidosis based on a biopsy of one of the small mucosal granulomas within the nasal cavity. Um, when we're considering something like AERD or NERD, again, this is going to be in patients with a classic triad of nasal polyps, asthma, and aspirin or NSAID sensitivity. Um, also ask about the uh, consumption of alcohol and if they have symptoms with that. That's not part of the classic triad, but it is something that has been noticed over time and published about. Urine LTE4 can be helpful, and the Mayo, uh, Mayo Clinic group has published on this, noting um, a pretty significant um, specificity for um, increased urine LTE4 in these patients. And sometimes patients uh, will need to undergo aspirin challenge if the diagnosis is unclear. The recent EPOS document has uh, given this diagram for the diagnosis of um, NERD. And um, it's a pretty simple diagram to follow. And uh, eventually, if the patient is, if it is not an overtly clear uh, diagnosis, then the patients can potentially undergo an oral bronchial or na nasal aspirin challenge. In the US, this is typically done via the oral route. I know in Europe, um, they will often do the uh, intranasal uh, challenge with lysine aspirin. Um, finally, I'm going to talk for just a couple minutes about tissue biopsy. Um, so most of the time when we get tissue from CRS patients, it's going to be as part of our standard surgical pathology. And usually the tissue that we're trying to send is, is tissue obtained from polyps or inflamed sinus mucosa. I usually try to avoid uh, inferior turbinate specimens um, just because these the inferior turbinates do not typically form polyps or um, show uh, the exact um, uh, tissue manifestations that our sinus tissue does. As a basic information, um, and in some centers, this is, this is all you're, um, we're able to obtain, um, I usually ask for an assessment of eosinophilia or if it's more of a neutrophilic type disease, um, and whether the, the um, inflammation is mild, moderate, or severe. The characteristics of the tissue and mucin can also be assessed. The Sydney Australia group has published on a structured histopathology uh, profile in CRS, uh, and 
That, an example of that is shown here. And this is courtesy of Richard Harvey in their publication. Um, and as you can see, there's an assessment um, first of inflammation. So overall inflammations, eosinophils, neutrophils, and uh, the predominance of the, the inflammation. There's also an assessment of tissue characteristics like edema, um, ulceration, metaplasia, fibrosis, and then um, an assessment of mucin. Are there fungal elements, eosinophil aggregates, or Charcot lighting crystals? And um, within this structured uh, report are, is an excellent um, uh, guide for pathologists on how they actually grade all of this. Uh, and you can see those, some of that guidance here. So I think uh, the benefit of biopsy information and in CRS treatment um, is especially helpful with the inflammatory profile. So as I mentioned before, increased eosinophils has been associated with things like worse symptoms, worse quality of life, higher recurrence rate, potential um, advocacy for more extensive surgical approaches. Um, and these patients may be candidates for things like biologic therapy versus neutrophilic disease, which um, may respond to treatments like macrolides, which has an effect on the IL-8 pathway. Also, um, in patients with Th2-mediated disease, we want to consider the possibility of asthma, especially if it has not been diagnosed, as this can be a significant comorbidity for patients. Um, and then also the presence or absence of fungus can help us classify the disease as well, especially if we're considering a diagnosis of allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. So um, I've spoken a little bit longer than I was anticipating, but um, in summary, uh, ancillary testing can definitely be helpful for CRS diagnosis and treatment. I think we need to really look closely at the patient's symptoms, um, their endoscopy findings, physical examinations, any comorbidities that they've had, make sure to ask the right questions, and then consider ancillary testing as necessary based on all of this contributing information. So with that, I'll stop. Um, and again, I will thank you all for the um, invitation to speak. I think there's a few minutes for questions and I'm happy to take any uh, questions that you might have. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sara, for an illustrious, fantastic, and uh, most elaborate lecture on evaluation of uh, chronic rhinosinusitis and allergic rhinitis in practice. Uh, we have a few questions uh, before we wind up. So I'll be taking a few questions, kindly answer them at leisure. Does Ig levels have any value in indexing surgery? This is a question by Dr. Chetana from Mumbai. You, you asked if IgE levels yeah. have an effect on the decision making for surgery. So um, I'm not, I'm not aware of um, any literature that supports uh, IgE as a predictor of surgical outcomes. Um, and in my practice, that's not something that I have traditionally used. Um, IgE levels are used if there is a consideration of uh, biologic therapy, uh, especially omalizumab, um, which is approved for uh, asthma currently, as well as chronic urticaria. And studies have been completed for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. So we anticipate there's probably going to be an approval for that soon. Um, so in that particular case, IgE levels would be helpful. Um, in the other thing, is, so, um, and that's total IgE, specific IgE levels are helpful in the evaluation of um, allergic profiles if you're looking at in vitro allergy testing, as I, as I suggested. Okay. What's the specific indication for an intradermal skin test? When do you prefer that over a skin flick test? So um, intradermal skin testing is kind of a classic technique um, that's been used to quantify the level of allergy. So as I mentioned, this is a technique where there are progressive injections of 
um, starting with a lower concentration of antigen and progressing up to higher concentrations. In clinical practice, that particular technique is not often used these days due to time constraints and in the US um, decreased reimbursement, uh, insurance reimbursement for that type of technique. Um, but it is important to really understand the technique and kind of the history of it and how that plays into uh, things like uh, blended techniques, which use the skin prick followed by a single intradermal test. Is there any added risk of anaphylaxis during the intradermal skin testing? Great question. Yes. So, um, so that is an actual question into the intradermal space um, where the inflammatory cells lie. And so, um, so the, those uh, injections potentially, at, well, any type of skin test can lead potentially to anaphylaxis. Um, but uh, common sense would say that um, compared to a, a standard skin prick test, the actual injection of a, an intradermal may lead to uh, the potential for anaphylaxis. So do we, while measuring the size of the vein, uh, should we, if there is a pseudopodia, should we take the diameter of the entire pseudopodia? So um, different practitioners do this in different ways. And um, typically what, what I have seen done most frequently and what we do in our practice is that we will take the diameter of the actual wheel itself uh, and then just in our notation, we will write a P for pseudopod to indicate that that is uh, a bit more of a reaction than the level that just the wheel has noted. What are the most common fungal uh, hypersensitivities that you encounter in your practice? Which are the common fungi? Sure. Um, so. In the US, the two most common things that are tested for is gonna be um, aspergillus and alternaria. Um, and then we, I live in the Southeast US, which is very hot and humid and has lots of allergies, especially mold allergies. So um, we also consider testing for things like cladosporium, uh, penicillium, um, bipolaris, things like that. Um, some of those are distinctly associated with allergic fungal sinusitis as well. Some of the dematatious fungi. Okay. Uh, which is the particular site for nasal brushing? From where should we take the sample? Yeah, so um, most people will do um, kind of along the inferior turbinate. That's uh, kind of the classic description for um, rhinitis sampling. Um, depending on, so there are lots of different techniques that I you know, talked about for the nasal sampling. And in various uh, research studies, depending on what people are looking for, they may take samples from different locations. So, uh, for example, like using the, the little nasal sponges um, or more nasal packs to collect inflammatory mediators. Sometimes those are placed in the middle meatus if you're looking for mediators from the ethmoid sinuses. Um, we have actually recently been doing an evaluation on um, local allergy profiles in central compartment atopic disease. And as I mentioned, that is more associated with middle turbinate and superior turbinate. And so we've actually been taking um, brush samples a little bit further in the nose along the middle turbinate and posterior nasal septum as compared to the inferior turbinate. So it depends on the entity that you're studying and what you're looking for and where that would be uh, most fruitful in the nasal cavity. Okay, the, the next question would be, uh, what is the best time for a nasal cytology? Should any medication should be stopped before doing a biopsy? And also yes. cytology. 
So, um, so I mentioned that there are several medications that can potentially interfere with um, cytology results or pathology results, uh, especially with regard to the level of eosinophils. And so um, things like antihistamines, uh, any steroids, systemic or topical, um, anti-leukotrienes potentially can. And then um, one thing that was on my chart that I didn't um, talk about uh, out loud was decongestants. Uh, chronic use of decongestants, as we know, can potentially lead to rhinitis medicamentosa and can actually change some of the epithelial biology as well. Um, so typically when we're thinking about things like um, steroids, um, in most research studies, we'll have people stop steroids for about four weeks um, prior to obtaining kind of line uh, tissue sample. Um, antihistamines in allergy evaluation, it's, a, it's dependent on the particular antihistamine. Um, but those need to be stopped between two and seven days, depending on the actual antihistamine. We usually, in our patients, um, we just give them instructions to stop for seven days. Um, so, uh, and um, I am not sure that I know a specific time for the anti-leukotrienes um, as far as their effect. Okay. Can we take a biopsy during an out in the outpatient itself while we suspect a chronic TRS patient? And sure. So, oh, go ahead. Uh, what was the second part of the question? If so, from where exactly can we take the biopsy? Yeah, so um, it is certainly possible to do uh, biopsies in the clinic or in the outpatient setting if, if the patient is not anticipated to have surgery or um, you know if you want to get a better characterization of their disease before taking them to surgery um, so typically what you'll want to uh, get is the something that represents the sinus tissue if you're if you're looking for uh, pathology that is associated with chronic rhinosinusitis so if they have uh, obvious polyposis, I think that that is, you know, the best place to go. Um, so, you know, any, any obvious polyps coming from the middle meatus into the nasal cavity, anything like that. Um, if there are no polyps, then oftentimes you can see edema of the middle meatus or the uncinate process and obtain some of that tissue as well. Um, if you have a patient with this central compartment uh, pathology, then oftentimes there will be actual polyps or polypoid disease coming off of the middle turbinate. And, th and that is very accessible um, to get those polyps there. Wonderful. Um, I think uh, we are coming to the end of the session. And uh, in five, one last question from my side, what is the commonest allergen in your practice, madam? Um, a, a dust mite or a fungus or a pollen or any food yes. allergen? So I would, so um, just as I think about my practice, I would say that symptomatically, the most common things that people complain of are going to be um, springtime allergies, which in, in our region is associated with trees, uh, most commonly oak in my region. Um, but when we do testing, the, I, the most common thing that we see is going to be house dust mite on the testing. And then when we go and ask the patients about it, um, you know, they, they will oftentimes agree that they have symptoms to those things. They just may not be as noticeable because it doesn't have a seasonality to it. Wonderful. Thank you very much, madam. And there are a lot of budding rhinologists who take home a lot of uh, wonderful points from your wonderful lecture. Looking forward to hear you from you in the month of October. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. That was a wonderful, wonderful lecture. You completely did justice to that topic. You can, I don't think anyone could have done it better than you did. Uh, we look forward Thanks. to seeing you in our new uh, session. So Dr. Sarah is going to come back with us in two more sessions. One is we're going to have a two and a half hour lecture only about the immunology of chronic rhinosinusitis. sinusitis. Dr. Sarah is going to be joined by Dr. Amber Luong and Dr. Andrew Lane on that one. Uh, and in another session, we have a complete session only on aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease or SAMTAS triad as, uh, as we would like to call it. So these two sessions, again, Dr. Sarah, Wise is going to join us and we're going to discuss these topics again in complete detail. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a meeting now, so I'm going to let you go without holding you back. Thank you so much. It was wonderful having you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. So uh, for the rest of us who are going to stick on with us, uh, I just want to announce that today we're going to have a live surgical dissection after the second lecture. That is going to be by Dr. Andrew Swift on evaluation of uh, a rhinosinusitis patient. Before the second lecture, we're going to have um, a panel discussion now on the changing trends in the management of chronic rhinosinusitis in modern rhinology. Uh, just to add a, a brief note about the two cases that we have, uh, we, ha we are going to uh, start a case uh, uh, demonstration based on the EPOS 2020 classification. At least that's what we're trying to do, just so that we can revise what we've already heard from last week. So we've got... Um, primary uh, localized and primary uh, two cases of primary localized primary localized but diffuse from the cardiac yeah primary local yeah primary localized and primary diffuse uh, disorders that we're going to discuss today we're going to have surgery uh, so live surgical demonstration and during that we're going to discuss in detail again about the eg pathogenesis and management of those conditions as well so now we're going to uh, start uh, with our panel discussion i would like mr pramod singla who's uh, uh, from sun pharma well, would you please be kind enough to uh, introduce our esteemed panelists to the audience thank you so much thank you Thank you, sir. Uh, so I take this privilege uh, uh, to invite our panelists. First, I'll invite uh, Dr. Amin Zawair from Canada. Uh, Dr. Amin Zawair is uh, uh, MD, FRCSCS, and FARS. He's a director of St. Paul's Sinus Center, uh, research uh, uh, and director of UBC ENT. Uh, welcome, Dr. Amin Zawair. Then we have our senior most, one of the senior most ENT, uh, uh, Dr. Amitabh Roy Chaudhary from Calcutta. Uh, he is a consultant at uh, AMRI Hospital, uh, Calcutta, uh, and uh, Calcutta Medical Research Institute. Uh, welcome, Dr. Amita uh, Roy Chaudhary. And then we have our uh, very senior uh, doctor, uh, very senior doctor, and it doesn't require any introduction, uh, Dr. K.R. Uh, Meghnath. He is a senior consultant at Ma ENT Hospital. And uh, welcome, sir. And then we have Dr. Naveen uh, Patel from Ahmedabad. He is a senior consultant at Sterling Hospital. Welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Naveen Patel, sir. And uh, doctor, I welcome Dr. Kranti uh, Bhavna from Patna. She is Assistant Professor, Department of Otorolaryngology, Auto AIMS, uh, Patna. Welcome, ma'am. And uh, doctor, uh, I take this uh, privilege to uh, welcome and invite Dr. Neelam Vaid from Pune. She is a Senior Consultant, KM Hospital. And we are uh, very fortunate and privileged uh, that this session will be moderated by uh, uh, Dr. Satish Jain. Uh, he doesn't require any introduction. He's uh, one of the leading uh, uh, consultant of the country and is a director and chief consultant department of uh, ENT, uh, Jain EMT Hospital and NIMS uh, University and Narayana Multispecialty Hospital. And this uh, session will also be moderated by one of the senior uh, ENT surgeon of the country, Dr. Srinivas Murthy from Bangalore. He is a senior consultant in Columbia uh, Asia Hospital. And uh, Dr. Gora Medicari, uh, he is a consultant uh, rhinologist medical hospital. So with this, uh, I hand over the session to Dr. Satish Jain, Dr. Gaurav, and Dr. Srinivas. Over to you, sir. So Dr. Srinivas Murthy uh, is actually uh, one of our moderators for this session. We're going to begin the discussion today. Uh, your mic is on. Okay. So I'm just going to share my screen now. I hope you guys can see it. Okay. Is Dr. Java online? 
It's actually too early in the day for him, but I think I saw him. He's online right now. Ab baat kare. Hello, am I audible? Uh, slightly louder, please. Hello, am I audible? No, no. You need to be a little bit louder. Is there something? Yes, sir. You be able to hear you, sir. Continue. So good evening, good evening, everybody. So pleasure to be here with Gaurav again, and you know the Gaurav is always uh, I call him dynamite. He's always one step ahead than what we think. Thank you, Gaurav, for uh, making me part of this uh, academic event. Thank you, and uh, big thanks to Dr. Srinivas Murthy for being with us. And it's an amazing day with the top. you know i would say the leading rhinologists of the country together and it's a amazing uh, opportunity for me to interact with them to begin this interaction and i welcome dr amit jamey dr meghnath navin patel dr neelam ved amita roy choudhary kranti all these people are dedicated rhinologists we all know so to begin with this panel discussion is basically an interaction and our our goal is to extract more and more information from these you know learned people so to begin with to niche ke ja raha hu so to begin with our discussion we all know we are just going to start with the common clinical situations on our uh, you know the people who are watching Yeah, our goal is to give maximum information to them through our learned panelists and this first situation we all know the ct scan is a very very important part of work up for chronic rhinosinusitis and i can see dr neelam on panel neelam i know has a, a dedication in uh, you know imaging i know her husband who is a uh, radiologist and neelam has published a lot of articles on radiology i have gone through and those are truly mesmerizing and her knowledge on radiology is something we need to know more and more know from her so neelam can you hear me yes yeah, satish very well hi hope everything is good i am perfect perfect it's nice to see you thank you so neelam my question is based on certain facts you know there are a lot of publication nowadays the question is in chronic rhinosinusitis we generally tend to get ct scan done just before surgery to get more and more anatomic information the role of ct is to provide us anatomical details in, which is important in surgical planning now there are a lot of publications where people emphasize on upfront ct scan even before starting medical therapy generally we get after the appropriate medical treatment so looking at these publications my question is what we want to know from you from your experience what is your opinion regarding you know getting upfront ct scan versus delayed scan just before surgery uh, in my opinion uh, satish uh, i feel the upfront ct scans uh, all these studies that we are seeing are, are basically a cost benefit ratio so the, the studies are more based on economics and the benefits of that to a patient or, and the healthcare system fortunately in our country we are not so much governed by these uh, policies which are cost benefit and our focus always has been the patient first um, i feel if you look at it from a patient's only perspective uh, i would still prefer a, a delayed scan uh for the simple reason that uh sorry for that uh for the simple reason that the delayed scan gives me a better analysis of whether the patient really needs surgery so as far as i am concerned it's going to be a delayed scan uh definitely in favor uh, vis a vis an upfront scanning so delayed scan means you order a ct scan when you plan surgery finally yes so why i'm asking this policy of not getting ct scan up front the previous policy was based on the fact that the ct scan is a source of radiation it costs a lot of money but now the time has changed you know there are a lot of ct techniques available with minimizing radiation and a very low cost another fact why i'm asking many a times 
you give on uh, keep on giving medical therapy you may not be knowing what exactly the disease is going on because you cannot be 100% sure on a diagnosis of crs only on the basis of symptomatology even on the basis of classical symptoms of crs roughly 30 to 40% of the patients have radiological findings you know many a time endoscopic findings i would say to direct the radiology Many a times, many a times, we keep on giving medical treatment and ultimately it turns out to be a different diagnosis. Like for example, fungus. If you know it is a fungus, is a straightforward indication for surgery, there's no point in giving medical treatment. So why not upfront radiology rather than a delayed scan? That is the question. So if the question is still to me, uh, I still, I agree with what you're saying, uh, Satish, but at the same time, when you say we're giving the patient um, medical treatment, it's not that you're giving the patient medical treatment not under supervision. So the way I would look at it is a patient is going to take medical treatment for two weeks in my uh, setup. I, I'm not talking about the recommended six weeks as, you know, recommended in the protocols that are given. So that's where I would differ. My patient would take medical treatment optimal that varies from you know person to person clinic to clinic for two weeks and then i would do a scan in the event that the patient has as you said maybe fungus even then the optimal medical treatment of an antibiotic a steroid whatever it is that we are giving definitely will improve my surgical outcomes because i will be reducing a super added infection i will be uh, reducing edema so I think, uh, you know, giving a patient two weeks of antibiotics, uh, intranasal steroids, topical, um, you know, oral steroids, uh, and then doing the scan is not really going to uh, be something that the patient's going to suffer um, some sort of adverse uh, effects of. What's your point? You are taking a call after uh, two weeks treatment, two weeks. how long yeah. to 10 weeks? Yeah, I, I do it for two weeks. That's right. that's my uh, thing. So uh, right. in two weeks, if the patient also symptomatically is not improving and I want a scan, it is two weeks. Uh, I will never send the patient on the first visit. Uh, the way I tell them is, look, you know, this is the treatment. Do it two weeks and after two weeks, meet me with a scan. So they are always advised a scan. The only thing is it's not on the first day, it's on the 14th day. Okay. So Neelam, can I ask, after two weeks, did the patient respond and patient doesn't respond? How do you take a call further? Uh, a lot of that is going to be endoscopic. I will be putting an endoscope on first day and the 14th day. So I will have some visual uh, analog whereby I can see what's happening. There will be a difference in the patient's symptoms that I will see. That will help me. And the scan, when I see Satish after 14 days, if it's still showing me uh, a lot of disease in spite of the fact that I've given the patient uh, all this treatment, I feel more justified in being able to tell the patient, look, you may need surgery as an option. Okay, great. So that is something from experience. Can I quickly have opinion from the experienced people, Dr. Meghna, Dr. Naveen, your quick opinion. Do you agree with Neelam or you defer with her and do something else? Yeah, I, I, I take uh, usually, I agree like Neelam, we advise them an upfront CT scan and tell them to come back after about 10 to 14 days of medication. For me, usually I give them 10 days of medication then ask them to come with a CT scan PNS. And I always complement my information with an endoscope. So it's a three-dimensional information which I'm looking at. But okay. not upfront. Yes, not upfront. Dr. Meghnath. Yeah. What I do is I give three to six weeks of medication and uh, uh, three to six weeks of antibiotic and antihistamine and steroid nasal spray. These two things I'll give for six months. What I tell them is, if you are comfortable, continue it. If you are not comfortable, come back to me. I will do the CT scan. The diagnosis is mostly on the history rather than on the CT scan. So what I do is, I, as I told you, I will give the medication. And after six months, if his number of attacks of sinusitis or rhinitis have come down, we will continue with the medication. If the attacks have not come down, that means we are unable to treat him medically in that scenario, I will do the CT scan. But again, I would like to do the CT scan in a second visit, even though he is having a lot of symptoms. Okay. I'm, uh, the, the, I don't want to do the CT scan when absolutely there are less symptoms or no symptoms. And then I will not be getting the information 
to what extent I have to do the surgery. So I would like to do the CT scan in the worst position is better for me to understand the extent of surgical dissection during the surgical treatment. Great. So let's go to your student, Ames, Ranti. Would you agree with all of these or you have some different policy? Or in any given situation, that you do something else like in atypical presentation, some, something like uh, you, you are not very well convinced with the diagnosis of CRS or something like that. So uh, in institutes, the situation is also very, uh, is a bit different that we get many referrals. So you should understand at that time, many of them are already with CT scans. Am I audible? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So many of them are already coming with scans. That is also one of the, uh, you know, you can say whether it's advantage or disadvantage because they come with diagnosis. Uh, if we talk there are two group of patients, one would be having symptoms and will take a proper history. And uh, I would, uh, as you said, I also follow something what Neelam Ma'am follows is, uh, as I talked about two group of patients, one already has a scan and history says that the patient is, uh, is sort of on the on the pathway where he's not responding to treatment they are managed a bit differently than patients who come primarily to us and those who come to us symptoms i would always not only take history but do a detailed endoscopic examination before deciding upon the even the medical management what i'm going to give uh, give them further and we try it for two weeks yes and students you know you do not get ct scan dates so soon so usually uh, uh, usually within 15 days time, they usually come back with scans. So that is what we get uh, for those patients who are primarily coming to us without any scans. There are patients who have scans and multiple diagnoses before. So institutes, uh, institutes have such, pro uh, such patients with them. In such patients, it, it always depends how old is the scan, what are his symptoms. And if I feel that, uh, yes, this patient is not being benefited, I would go for an upfront, as you say, that he has presented to me, I would go for a repeat scan as to what's happening inside because uh, it depends how, uh, uh, how old the scan is and uh, all that factor. And the other aspect also, as you said, that nowadays with CT, multi-detector CT and multi-planar deformations, the exposure of radiation is really less. You just have to very the the sievert exp, uh, exposure is really less, and uh, we can actually go for upfront CT in such cases where I do suspect something else going on. Great. So it depends upon the situation. So yes. finally, before we move on to the next question, can I ask Dr. Amin Javed to sum up this situation? Whether to go in for an upfront CT scan in this era? When we can have a CD scan like cone beam CD scan with much less radiation hazard, with much, you know, the economical CD scan, with a clear-cut situation in mind with a diagnosis that we need to follow with the medical treatment, not with the surgery directly. Is there any harm in going with the upfront CD scan and, or what is your, your personal opinion? Thank you very much. First of all, I'm sorry for being a little bit late. Uh, as Gaurav knows, it's a, a bit early in the morning here and I'm, I'm just heading to surgery, so uh, apologies about that. Um, it's great to see you all. Great to see you, Gaurav, looking so well. Thank you. Um, and nice uh, chatting with all of you, and uh, Satish, nice meeting you online again. Thank you. So um, my, my, and, and, uh, so my, I'll be very honest, my opinion is that uh, I have no issues doing an upfront CT scan. Um, I, think, I think the benefits, um, are, are extensive as you've listed on the right side of your slide and, and the negative points are very minimal as you've listed on the left side of your slide. I mean, it takes about 30 seconds to do a CT scan. Radiation is almost very, very minimal. Uh, there is no harm to the patient. It gives you as a surgeon a lot more information as you have already pointed out. Um, I, think, I think there is no harm in, in gaining information uh, when, the, when the cost is low and the and the side effects are minimal. So I, I have no issues getting a CT. My threshold for getting a CT scan is, I would say, almost zero. I, I, as Gaurav knows, a patient will come in, we'll send them down the hallway, get a CT scan, and send, see them right back. Um, sometimes there is a delay in getting a CT scan, and that's completely acceptable, unless you're really worried on your endoscopy. But I think getting CT information um, is great. The more knowledge you have about the patient, the better you can treat them. So 
uh, unless there is a significant reason for not getting it or it's unavailable, um, my threshold for getting a CT scan is very low overall. Okay. Thank you both. So we have heard both aspects of the situation. While Neelam said the cost is a uh, factor on the basis of these uh, articles were published, but this is a real fact because otherwise many a times the weeks of antibiotics and steroids are given and finally you get to reach to a different diagnosis and that is something not acceptable. Thank you very much. And we quickly move on to our next situation. And I start here with uh, Dr. Amin Javed, his opinion. These days, we hear a lot and lot about the precision medicine in chronic rhinosinusitis management. Precision medicine. It is a time of precision medicine. And we believe in segregating the CRS. It's a heterogeneous disease. It's not a, a similar disease in all patients. It's a heterogeneous disease. And we believe in segregating into different endotype to give a tailor-made treatment to the particular patient. So my question is, how do you clinically decide that what kind of endotype the patient is maybe having? Any uh, clinical features, any help of uh, investigation, what kind of investigation particularly you get done uh, to differentiate into different endotypes? That, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, so when you see a patient with polyps, you must try and differentiate them into different endotypes because that'll, that'll determine how you treat them in the future, what you do in your surgery, and what you do postoperatively, which is really the most important thing. So when I see a patient with polyps, um, especially living in Vancouver, where we have a large amount of Asian population, particularly from China, um, I do a bunch of blood work on these patients, um, and, and I published on this. Uh, the two things that I'm always looking for are eosinophils. Eosinophil counts both in blood and tissue, as well as the IgE levels. Um, and then, of course, we also do, along with that, we'll do uh, immunoglobulin um, uh, blood work. So we'll do IgG subclasses, IgA, IgM, um, and all the immunoglobulin subclasses. So when we see a patient uh, with polyps, other than doing a CT scan, we will do a whole bunch of blood work uh, to ensure that we can fit them into the right endotypic uh, basket. So we know that patients who have high eosinophils, for instance, will do much worse than patients who don't. And we, we also are starting to do more tests now. Uh, one of the new studies that we are studying on is cystic fibrosis because we have a high population of cystic fibrosis. And we have found that up to 7% of our patients who don't respond um, to medication actually may have cystic fibrosis in our chronic um, polyp patient uh, subgroup. So there's a, there's a bunch of studies that we will do on these patients to put them in the right basket and then treat them appropriately going forward. Boss, do you take the help of SMOT22 in uh, uh, segregating or reaching to a particular endotype? All our patients. SMOT22. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think everybody should have a have an outcomes test done of some kind. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So so everybody should have a SNOT twenty two done for sure, or an outcomes test of some kind, even if it's a simple VAS. Um, I think it does help uh, put them uh, in a category where you know where they're at pre op or pre treatment, and then uh, post op, and everybody gets a culture done as well. So I think doing all of those things is, is very, very important. You want to differentiate them more than just type one and type two. You also want to differentiate them um, into all the other subcategories. Make sure that you check for aspirin sensitivity. Uh, make sure you check for things like CF if you're living in a population like I am. Uh, check on their eosinophils, check on their neutrophils. You want to know if those polyps are eosinophilic or, or neutrophilic. Um, all those things are very important. We have a very strong collaboration with our, um, with our colleagues upstairs, our respiratory, respiratory colleagues. Um, so you have to check out their asthma, uh, make sure that they don't have um, ABPA. All these things need to be looked at. So we, we have a very strong protocol on what we follow when we see these patients. Okay. So we have seen uh, Dr. Shara Wai's illustrative uh, lecture just before on the investigations. So like uh, uh, Dr. Amir Javed has already mentioned that besides the clinical grounds, it takes into consideration IgE, eosinophil, 
an uncertain situation for AERD or something. Can I ask, uh, we have Dr. Amitabh Roy Chaudhary with us. Boss, would you like to add on any uh, investigation or any other point to further, you know, help us segregating into different endotypes? Uh, thank you, Sadish. I think uh, in to add to what uh, I would like to say to add to Dr. Javed is that you want to do this endotypic uh, distribution or division because you at the end of the day you are going to uh, decide which patient is going to behave in which way after the uh, yes. treatment and the main as a surgeon uh, we know a bulk uh, majority of our patient will eventually require surgery whether upfront or later so if we do the surgery the main challenge would again be uh, how will they behave with post-operative steroids and all that. So the important thing in deciding this thing is that if it's non-TH2 type, then the oral corticosteroid dependence will very dictate my treatment options and you know counseling to the patients. As far as the investigation, nothing else. Great. Thank you. So now move on to the different situation. Uh, next question. We all know in the last two decades, most of the work in CRS management has been done on understanding this disease. You know, earlier what Stemberger and Messenger advise you open up the sinuses, establish the ventilation and drainage, and we hope that the disease to recover. But many a times, having done all this, we see the, again the polyps coming back. So most of the time, in the last uh, few decades, what we have seen most of the publication about understanding this disease. And we have understood now According to that, there are various management options. We can see on the screen what we are choosing out of these now. So, Kranti, can I yes, ask sir. brief? I would have opinion from all the panelists on these important issues. A patient coming to you in your clinical practice, how do you decide where to finish the medical treatment and where to go in for surgery? What are your criteria? How do you take into consideration that now this is the end point for the medical treatment and now this is the time for moving on to the surgery without wasting time on the medical management? Uh, yes, sir. That's a very pertinent question because most of the chronic rhinosinusitis treatment depends, uh, as you have shown in this, we have steroid component and then we have the surgical component and the newer targeted therapies, okay? So patient comes to us, we all as routine start giving them either uh, to start off with antibiotics and corticosteroids, intranasal corticosteroids, oral corticosteroids. But there are a group of patients who will definitely come back to us. And if you see the duration, like if he's requiring a lot of oral corticosteroid systemic therapy schedules, might be in, you know, in a schedule of six months, he's requiring twice or thrice episodes of oral corticosteroids and his not 22 scores are not improving his symptoms are not improving and uh, so if i say if to uh, to start off as i said we all give a two week of you know medical therapy go for a scan and then uh, patients are called again for uh, for follow up so if these patients for for a duration say 6 weeks 12 weeks time and they come back with uh, you know, continuous same problems and their dependence on steroid is increasing or is not decreasing per se, then I would definitely counsel these patients, obviously also depending on the radiological finding that they would require surgery and uh, and actually go ahead with that. And be it uh, with polyposis, without polyposis, uh, surgery is uh, is the answer in uh, in both both the both the groups, though without polyposis has many other things to look into also. But surgery also has a role there as well. Great, great. Let's go to Dr. Meghnath. From out of his experience, boss, it should be a message that how do you decide when to go for surgery and end point of medical treatment? Quickly and brief, can we have from your side? I think you're muted. I, I think you have to unmute, yes. Uh, at least also I mentioned, usually I give the uh, medication for six weeks to six months. If this medication helps him, initially we'll be giving antibiotic and then we'll continue with the oral antihistamines and intranasal corticosteroids. If the patient has reduced the number of attacks of sinusitis or uh, symptoms, his snort scores have improved, then we will not think of surgery. If there is no improvement, he comes back with the same uh, picture 
then we will think of surgery. And so here, uh, I would like to make a statement. This is not the shifting from medical treatment to surgical treatment. No. In fact, you continue the medical treatment and add surgery. So post-operative will also they require medical treatment. And one important point is here, uh, I do assess the IgE and I look at the eosinophils. When the eosinophils are high, we require more of international corticosteroids and intermittently systemic steroids. When the IgE levels are normal, usually they require long-term macrolides, which is uh, much safer for me compared to the oral steroids. Non-polyvoidal disease, yes. Okay. So IgE, assessment of IgE levels and looking at eosinophils in the histopathology specimen is a very useful thing for me to decide whether I should take the help of the steroids or macrolides. Great. So, Neela? Uh, Sadish, pretty much the same. I think your Not question the, was, when would you really decide that this is a patient for surgery or we are just going to continue medical treatment, right? Can you hear me? I can hear you. She said that she would take into consideration lung McKay score. So, would you get a CT scan again for that? No. No, I wouldn't. Uh, so let, let's put it to you this way. Your question to us was that, you know, when is it that you're going to say medical treatment is enough and you're going to take the decision for surgery? You need a message from you to the audience that what is the end point of medical treatment when you think of surgery? Very, very brief and precise. So firstly, on the history, if the patient is coming to me with very many attacks in the past, he's telling me that every time he's had to go in for you know treatment from various other ENT surgeons, I'm already thinking that this is a patient who's going to need uh, surgery. Uh, the symptoms, if after you know I've given the patient the antibiotics and everything not resolving, I put in an endoscope, I'm seeing that the polypoidal changes that were there are still the same, and radiology is still showing me persistent uh, you know signs. I am going to look at uh, surgery as an option. It's a repeat scan. No, when I said persistent, I meant uh, persistent disease endoscopically. The scan I will do only once, uh, Satish. I, I really don't like repeat scans. Uh, it's nothing to do with radiation or anything like that. I just feel the scan, if I do it once, the scan is not an assessment of pathology. Scans uh, give us radiology from a roadmap point of view. They are something that gives us, as a surgeon, uh, information. To use a CT scan to evaluate pathology is not uh, what a scan is meant for. Great. If pathology is assessed more by history, by your endoscopy, uh, by all the other factors. But a CT scan for us as surgeons is, a, is actually just a roadmap. That's okay. what I feel. I think, Neera, this is a message to everyone that you don't need to repeat CT scan as the CT gives you an anatomical roadmap. You don't need to repeat it again and again. The rest of the decisions are on the basis of your clinical finding history, your endoscopic findings and other assessment. Thank you. So to sum up this, in brief, Dr. Amin Javed, can you tell us your first of call about taking a decision for surgery after the appropriate medical treatment. Can I ask you, how do you assess the inflammatory load to take a call for surgery? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, how do you assess the inflammatory load to take a call for surgery rather than wasting time on medical treatment? Yeah, I agree. So great question and great discussion and appreciate everybody's viewpoint. I think I think one of the biggest things when I, when I see a patient, I think of it in two, two modes. Is the problem anatomical or is the problem pathological, right? If the problem is a simple anatomical issue, they're not gonna keep getting, they're not gonna get better with medical management. So you've got a very deviated septum, you've got a concha bullosa, you've got something obstructive, a, a big cell in the frontal sinus. That patient is gonna need surgery to get better, particularly if they've had a good run at medical management. So that, that patient will need surgical management. And then there's this whole group of patients where the issue is not simply anatomical. It's something to do with the patient, with the pathophysiology of the patient, in which case we need to start thinking outside the anatomical box. And I think at that point, you need to do, think about surgery as an addition in the treatment algorithm for the patient, which is 
um, exactly what somebody somebody said before me is that in that in that patient the surgery becomes just part of the treatment. So you need to when you see the patient uh, decide whether there's an anatomical issue, in which case you just have to go fix it. Uh, no medical management is going to straighten somebody's septum or fix somebody's conchabulosa. But if the patient has a high inflammatory load on, on blood work, on endoscopy, on CT scan, then you need to think of surgery as an additional treatment in term, on top of everything that you're going to do for them medically. That's, I think, a very important distinction. I, I, think, I, think, I think the message for everyone. I think there's also a big difference in the way we practice, and that's quite important that we have the West as well as the East online together with us. Because in Canada, we have a referral system. So the physician treats the patient as long as he can. And when it doesn't improve, then he sends it over to us. So as, as far as my experience goes, we used to see about 75 to 80 patients a day in the clinic, all rhinological. And uh, most of the time, we ended up getting a scan on the first visit and operating on the patient eventually. Because we put them on the list because we have a wait list of about 18 months for the patient. So uh, in, in most of our patients used to be surgical by nature itself. But in India, where they have access to an ENT surgeon directly, the situation is much different, I guess. And that's where we need to have the knowledge when to operate and when to try medical line of management. So moving on to the next question, uh, Dr. Srinivas Murthy would take this question. You can address Hi. Good evening, everyone. So uh, as has already been uh, introduced by Gaurav, uh, we don't see this classical uh, chronic rhinosinusitis in our uh, clinical practice. We don't get somebody for nearly 12 weeks of symptoms. Most often we see patients uh, who have symptoms, they respond partially to medication and for various reasons, either because they're non-compliant or they, they have not been explained about the problem that they have, they go off medication or they go to another surgeon because they don't want to take long-term medication and then a diagnosis is made of CRS. Now, I present to you a 16-year-old boy who presents with repeated history of sneezing, nasal obstruction, facial pain and pressure, who has a seromucinous discharge initially, which then turns colored and very often requires uh, antibiotics to have relief. Um, and this can be as frequent as five to six episodes per year uh, with Complete resolution of symptoms in between. Next. And if this is a CT scan at, um, uh, taken when the patient visits us on the first visit and on interval CT scan, it is an absolute clear entity. What would your um, course of management be? Dr. Meghnath, sir. I think you're muted, sir. sir. You, have to unmute. you have to unmute yourself, sir. Uh, it looks like uh, non-IgE sinusitis. And uh, I think in this uh, situation, he is having more than five, six attacks in a year. I will proceed with the surgical uh, procedure. And uh, what is this? Balloon versus full house or selective or mini face? Mini -face. Correct. Would you uh, end up doing a? I would like uh, to do a full house, full yeah. house, full house face. Full house. The, the, the problem is, uh, if you keep observing these uh, patients, okay, earlier, some uh, 20, 25 years back, I used to do a limited face, looking at the, oh, this sinus is involved, let us open this. This is not involved, oh, let us not open it. After a few years, they come back with the symptoms. And when you repeat the scan, they do have the disease in the non-opened sin, unopened sinuses. And this is a, it puts us in a very ba bad situation. Uh, patient asks, uh, sir, you should have opened that. You are, now you say again surgery now. Okay. So over a period of time, I've shifted more towards the full house, unless I have a, an indication, like for example, somebody is having odontogenic maxillary sinusitis, that or a fungal sense. sinusitis of the sphenoid sinus. And the, all the other sinuses are normal then I will not open the other sinuses. Okay. Like for example, see in this case, the ethmoid is involved on one side, yeah. both maxillary sinuses are involved, but I don't know what the frontal and sphenoid. But today, these sinuses are involved. Tomorrow, after three months, six months, other sinuses are involved. But again, one has to think in his hand, 
is it safe to open the sphenoid and frontal? If you are going to cause harm to the patient by doing a, uh, opening the frontal and sphenoid, don't open them. Okay. Do a limited work. Okay. If your hands are safe, I think you can open all the sciences. Dr. Neelam, would you defer? You can't do this to me, Srinivas. <laughs> uh, yes, I would. Uh, uh, so, when you presented the history, you told me you are a 16 year old who's presenting with recurrent attacks of sneezing, you said. You said five to six episodes in a, in a year. Okay. Uh, and you also mentioned that this necessitates a course of antibiotics. Uh, the minute you put this necessitates a course of antibiotics, I take it with a pinch of salt. I just feel that um, a lot of us don't really see ENT surgeons. We end up seeing general practitioners. And their, uh, you know, uh, their reasons to give antibiotics are not the same as our reasons for giving no, antibiotics. Let us uh, assume it is with us. Um, Okay, in either case, I just feel that with sneezing, nasal obstruction, facial pain, pressure, 16-year-old, I would firstly think that maybe this child has some sort of an allergic component. Allergy. Yeah. Uh, I would ask for a family history of allergies. I'm sure I'd get something positive out there. Okay. I would give this patient a fair chance with intranasal steroids uh, as mm -hmm. nasal sprays. Uh, I would definitely talk to this child about using methi. Um, you know, I have a very strong, uh, I would say, belief now in nasal washes. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would like to watch this kid myself because if he's coming to me uh, for the first time, I'm not convinced based on the scan that you showed that I would look at surgery as my first line of That's treatment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it would be medical. I would like to follow up this kid myself and take it from there. Uh, because the scan that you showed me shows me mucosal disease. Uh, doesn't show me, at least in those two cuts that you showed Correct. me, anything anatomical uh, which is presenting. Uh, which is scan, scan. Uh, you know, any uh, problems. I'm not seeing any anatomical issue there. Correct. This query looks like uh, air fluid level. So, Correct. in my opinion, this is uh, not something I'd like to do surgery for as a first out. Okay. Um, any of the other panelists want to defer yeah, before I, I... I would like to add Murthy. Yeah, Dr. Uh, sir, I'll come back to you once yeah, yeah. Uh, the others have... Yeah, I, I would like to reiterate, I would like to give six months of intranasal corticosteroids and antihistamines before surgery, invariably. Oh. If okay. the patient is fine, means that means it's a more of allergy we should not do the surgery and one important thing point here is if you look at the scan this is an acute phase of sinusitis acute, yeah. correct acute phase of sinusitis correct so but again if he's getting acute phases in spite of the antihistamine and steroid then only we should do the surgery okay so by default what, even if he is having a fungal sinusitis polyps my patient will go with 6 months course of medication and if if he comes back with the symptoms, then only think of surgery. Even so, so, would you be calling this case as a uh, recurrent acute rhinosinusitis or would you be calling it as chronic rhinosinusitis? It's a, it's a chronic rhinosinusitis with acute attacks. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Kranti Bhavna, would you want to add? No, uh, in this particular case, I think I would really agree with Neelam ma'am. For to me, a 16 year old boy. Okay. who is completely asymptomatic in between and has a lot of symptoms, which is mostly allergic, I would really go ahead. And that's what I do in my routine practice is go ahead with intranasal corticosteroids. And, you know, um, there are studies which say you can continue this for a longer period of time sure. and washes. And that's more than, an, um, I feel that the, this child needs a longer follow-up to really decide whether I will open up the complete, you know, all the sinuses. Okay. would rather go for a medical management first. Okay, thank you. Dr. Amitabh Roy Choudhury and Dr. Naveen Patel, would you want to add anything yeah. or would you concur? Yeah, yeah. No, actually, I just want to add one thing that in this particular patient, I would call this a recurrent acute sinusitis because uh, of the, you know, nature of the attacks the patient is having. Okay. And because uh, I would try to find out why this recurrence is happening. And obviously, we have not discussed one point that we may have a very clear CT scan between the attacks, but there may be some pathology as if you stick the endoscope in the nose. Uh, symptom of the patient's not score and the endoscopic picture will add to the decision making. That's the only thing I would like to add. Okay. Dr. Patel? Yeah, uh, looking at the age of the patient and in between, as you said, there, can, uh, there is a normal scan. 
I would allow this patient to buy the surgery rather than sell the surgery. Okay. I'm I'm working with the medical management. Okay, Doctor ja Amin Jaber, any other investigation that you would like to do, and would you prefer a balloon sinuplasty in this patient? So in my opinion, thank you. In my opinion, this patient has an allergic component. I agree with everybody above, yeah. but I also believe that the the patient does have true recurrent acute sinusitis. You know, it matches the criteria. I think the um, allergies um, may be present, but maybe um, a, a secondary diagnosis, uh, and maybe the instigating factor as well. So it is something that needs to be looked at. I, I would get an allergist involved, get a proper allergy test done. But it, it means, um, I, see, I see an allergy slant to your history, but I do see a very strong recurrent acute um, sinus slant to your scans and to your history as well. So I think both are happening in parallel and both need to be looked after. I think this patient deserves an operation. Uh, I think this patient would do very well with an operation, uh, first of all. Um, I, I think I agree with the with the, the, the full house FES. I would not do a mini FES or a balloon um, sinuplast in this patient. Um, this patient, I think, is is slam dunk in, in, in the fact that you will get him much better from a recurrent acute. I mean, imagine getting six infections a year. Right? That is very, very problematic for anyone especially a 16 year old, um, and then get controlling his allergies at the same time. I think you need to uh, treat both things uh, simultaneously, but I, I truly think this patient deserves um, a surgical correction. Surgical. I, yeah. he, he matches all the classic diagnosis for a re a classic recurrent acute sinusitis. Yeah. The feature here is that in between episodes, he is completely normal. That's the key feature to make a diagnosis of recurrent acute rhinosinusitis when compared to chronic rhinosinusitis, where the baseline itself is at 30 or 40 percent. They never come back to zero. That's how we differentiate RARS from CRS. Okay. And this you patient matches RARS, is, in my opinion, yeah. Okay. Next, please. So this is a case that I would like to uh, discuss with everyone. This is uh, pretty common. Um, I've seen this happen in Canada. I've seen this happen in the UK as well, and it very much happens in India. So you operate on a patient who's of uh, not necessarily a rural background, but in this case it was, uh, and uh, she comes back after two years, even uh, after being advised to do regular follow-ups and uh, advised to actually um, uh, do her rinses on time. So she came in for the first six months, and when things got better, she just stopped coming to us. This is despite counseling them, actually. So this is the kind of picture that we saw in her. Uh, for the lack of time, I'm just going to forward this a little bit. In this case, apparently, she's been saying that she's doing her sinus rinses on a regular basis. And this is the picture that you see. We've got a 70-degree scope in uh, looking into the left frontal sinus. This is a patient with allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, which was bilateral. And actually, her, the posterior table of her frontal sinus is actually eroded. And now you can see that uh, she's come back after two years of surgery. And although the frontal sinus is open, you can see a grade 2 edema around the frontal sinus ostium. Okay, what would you do now? So my question is directed to Dr. Amitabh Roy Chaudhary. Would you do another surgery in this patient? Would you go aggressive and would you do a Lothrops in this patient? Uh, for, sorry, first off, thank you, Gaurav. First of all, I, I would uh, start the patient with some medical treatment in terms of, because she has, uh, I would like to find out for six months what treatment she received after the surgery. Did she receive any, did she actually do any rinse or whether it's medicated rinse or normal saline rinse? But no, I, would, I would again start with a saline budesonide rinse and, and a saline nasal rinse. Mm. And obviously uh, for uh, give her about four to six weeks time. And then I would scope her again and do a scan and see what is the uh, pattern of the disease. If she feels like she's a non-responder, then I would straight away go for a full house first with, with a uh, draft three. If she is responded very well, then I would continue with the uh, rinse and, you know, corticosteroid treatment and look at our other things. So that will decide the first six weeks of my treatment only in the form of budesonide rinse will decide. But if I have to do a surgery, I will definitely go for a draft three and a complete surgery. 
okay um uh, so she's asymptomatic at this point of time so she doesn't have any idea that she's got the swelling whatsoever okay uh, this is actually pretty common as well uh so um like you've already discussed this so i just want to add one uh, uh small follow up question that would be to dr navin patel actually what is your uh, deciding factor for surgery in this case if you want to do a revision so uh, would it be symptoms or would it be signs and imaging uh, for me symptoms uh, and signs correlate should correlate very well yeah. i will not touch a symptomatic patient okay so so, so symptoms are paramount and and there are enough signs for me to justify myself to think about the revision surgery because Uh, a draft 3 is not a small surgery so it should be taken with a uh, 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 it should be a wise decision because you if you don't do it correctly it will produce more scarring and uh, a bad cripple of the sinuses okay so uh, for you you would probably rely on the snot 22 scores and then decide and correlate it with what you find in the endoscopy yeah Okay. so like dr amita bochadri said this is what we did so we actually did uh, put her the only mistake of hers was that she was uh, rinsing in the sitting position now the problem with rinsing in the sitting position is that the frontal sinus is an anti gravity sinus so when you rinse in this position it actually just touches and falls back down so the fluid doesn't get retained there in fact uh, i think dr amin jabbar and i we are doing a paper on increasing the holding time in this position does it have any result, any uh, change in results when uh, so the plan what we're trying to prove is that instead of doing three rinses a week for 1 minute each if you do one rinse a week for 3 minutes will it give you the same result or a better result that's what we're trying to prove it works out to be much more economical for the patient as well because you don't have to use three saline bottles three uh, uh, you know respirals of buccinide and a lot of waste of time for the patient as well so in this position you can actually see that uh, you know the fluid gets retained in the frontal sinus and then it trickles down to the sphenoid and then comes back up into the maxillary sinus so she did this for about a month which is roughly around the same time that uh, dr amitabh Ch roy choudhury said and she comes back to us and this is the picture that we saw uh, the only point that i would differ was in in this case is that uh pardon me that i'm i'm um, i mean my, my school of thought is slightly different from yours but if the frontal sinus ostium is open and if there is no bone work that needs to be done then you don't need to do a draft 3 in this patient uh now this is my school of thought not necessary that everyone has to agree with me uh, the reason being that the main goal of this uh, patient surgery is that we need the medication to actually enter into her sinus so if we can get rid of the swelling with help of oral steroids or topical steroids like in this case then we honestly don't need to operate uh, we will discuss the draft in a uh, an, in a new case uh, wherein we did try oral steroids and which didn't work for the patient and in those kind of cases i would prefer to uh, do a draft now coming back to another controversial topic my question would now be directed to dr neelam wed if that's okay so there is evidence that um, the symptoms in fungal sinusitis actually appear at a much later stage when a lot of sinuses are actually involved when compared to the signs we actually see the signs first so this is a predisposing sign for a much worse inflammation which happens later on what do you have to say about this would you still treat this asymptomatic patient or in any form i'm not just saying that surgically but would you take action at this point of time in the sense that you don't like the way the swelling looks or is the like dr jawar usually usually tells me the swelling is bothering you more than it's bothering her would that be your uh, take or would you go ahead and not take a chance and treat this with steroid or topical medication either ways well, thanks for that question um, at the end of the day i'm treating a patient i'm not treating uh, either a scan or an endoscopic picture even this lady when she came back to you after 2 years um, she's obviously come back to you for a symptom if she has come back to us for a symptom is when i think as a physician or as a surgeon i will intervene if the patient is completely asymptomatic uh, i don't see any reason especially to be aggressive from a surgical point of view uh, i don't think i'm going to treat uh, something which is asymptomatic but yes you have operated this patient you are seeing this patient let's say 6 months down the line and you are seeing an um, an edema there like you pointed out in that picture 
you have every right exactly in what you did on teaching the patient a better method of irrigation. But definitely no surgery for an asymptomatic patient. I don't think I can justify it. Okay, definitely. Uh, I, sorry, anyone wants to add something? Yeah, I, I just want to add something about uh, about the. So, in patient of, uh, we are talking about a fungal ball or an allergy fungal rhinosinus. Agree that, you know, same important. But there are times when patient might not be symptomatic, but the scan does, a, you know, typical fungal ball. And in such cases, I actually counsel the patient that they would be requiring surgery. And, uh, you know, in that case, it can happen that patients might not be as symptomatic as a scan is showing. But in fungal ball, my threshold for surgery is low. I would operate, I would counsel them up front that they would be requiring surgery sooner. Uh, also because, you know, you, you would be definitely giving them uh, corticosteroids, be it topical or oral. Uh, that is part and parcel of the, uh, of the, you know, pathway you go in treating AFRS. But if there is definite uh, signs of, you know, the typical CT picture, uh, I would start counseling them that they would require surgery in time if they are not responding to medication. The threshold is a bit low for that. Okay, thank you. So uh, now my question is actually directed to uh, Dr. Amin Java. Are there any other modalities of medical management that you would like to employ in this case to prevent recurrences? Like, do you believe in uh, immunotherapy for this patient because she's AFRS? Would, would it help us to reduce uh, chances of recurrences in these patients? Uh, great case, Gaurav, and, and some very pertinent uh, points that you've touched on. Um, as you know, I, I, I spent half my life working on AFRS patients. Uh, and one of the things that I've found is that the most important thing with these patients is, is good follow-up and good topical care. And that video that you showed was priceless. And I think everybody should learn a lot um, from, from two points that you made. One is the positioning and two is the holding pattern. I mean, those are the two things that we're, um, we've published on, we're investigating and we'll publish on more. Uh, but, but those two things are probably the most important things that you mentioned. Um, in terms of um, immunotherapy, uh, as you know, there have been groups around um, the, the Mabry group in, in Texas um, who, who told the world that immunotherapy worked very well for these patients. The rest of us just didn't find that. We, we haven't found success with immunotherapy in this group of patients because it's, it's not a true allergy. So that's something that you really need to remember. Um, I, I tried immunotherapy, I gave up on it. Um, as you know, I'm trialing a bunch of other things and investigating a bunch of other things. I've tried uh, antimicrobial photodynamic therapy on these patients. The problem with these patients is you can treat them, you can make them look really good but when they lose contact with you and they lose doing what you tell them to do, uh, the disease will eventually come back because they're reacting to stuff in the environment. Uh, and, and that's right in the beginning when I talked about anatomy versus uh, pathophysiology, this is a true pathophysiologic disease. So you need to make sure that their anatomy is perfectly fixed. Uh, you can see on that patient that you just presented, the surgery was done really well. She doesn't really need more surgery. She needs more medical care, more uh, topical care. And, Exactly like you said, she, her symptoms are going to get worse and she's going to feel her symptoms much later uh, once her disease is much worse. So if you don't follow her up, um, she's going to get to you when it's too late. In fact, the picture you showed was, was um, grade two or grade three edema, but I didn't, I didn't see any mucin up there. Quite often, as you know, you'll see patients with a lot of mucin up there. And if you don't flush that out, you don't give them a head start because the antigenic stimuli is still too high. So those are very important points. The other thing that I think when you were up here with me, the other thing that we were investigating was biologics and I'm not sure how available biologics are at, at your end, but uh, we just published a paper this month in AGRA uh, on the use of Nucala in AFRS patients. And we found that there was actually a positive trend uh, on patients on mepolizumab uh, and AFRS patients. And, and that's a study that I think touches on another aspect of treatment for these patients. Uh, as you know, Dupixent has just been approved in, um, in Canada uh, and in the US last week. And so we now have access to Dupilumab, uh, which we're very excited for because it's, a, it's the first double uh, interleukin um, uh, biologic. And so it, it blocks both IL-4 and IL-13. So we're very much looking forward to seeing the real life effects 
of these drugs on this difficult group of patients? Because I find that this group of patients are really the most challenging group of patients when, when it comes to CRS. Um, so those are my other modalities. As you know, we're investigating things like, Budes uh, like uh, betadine, which we've published on in this group of patients. We've seen a positive trend with that. We've published on Manuka honey with this group of patients. And we're also studying um, hydrogen peroxide rinses on this patient. So there's a bunch of topical treatments that we're studying for this group of patients, including uh, photodynamic therapy, which we will publish soon, hopefully in the next couple of years. Mm. I just want to clarify that, uh, yeah, we did, we, uh, uh, although uh, there are a lot of modalities of management, uh, Manuka honey at the point is not uh, proven to work on its own. It can work in conjunction with other me uh, medical modalities, and actually that's how we got the idea of using hydrogen peroxide, because the active component in Manuka honey is actually hydrogen peroxide itself. So in my opinion, and from what I saw, of course, this is unpublished data yet, but what we saw uh, in our hydrogen peroxide study is that the people who were doing it were pretty uh, happy. And even intraoperatively, when uh, intra, in, in the clinic, when we flush it out with hydrogen peroxide, it's so easy to remove that thick allergic fungal mucin. So I think that's another uh, way where we can actually kind of uh, work on it. So uh, at the moment, the only proven uh, therapy which works uh, is butisonide in AFRS. It's been a game changer in terms of management of allergic fungal uh, rhinosinusitis. Uh, I'm just gonna show you another case. As we discussed, we've got this 37 year old guy who's been operated thrice previously for, uh, for uh, nasal polyposis with CRS. That's the diagnosis that I had in him. This is what his sinuses look like. This is at his first presentation. You can see there was an accessory ostium there. This is the frontal sinus opening completely locked off. Uh, you can see there's an accessory ostium and there's a lot of discharge coming through, which is trickling into the nasopharynx, okay? And um, mind you, this is after three weeks of oral steroids. And this is on the other side, the left side, you can see it's a little better when compared to the right side. This is again after oral steroids, so that's the reason why it's looking pretty good. Now in this case, because there's no resolution of the frontal sinus disease, uh, and there was no improvement on the CT scan and there was the extensive neoosteogenesis, we actually did a Lothrops. I'm not gonna go into the procedure of the Lothrops, but I'm gonna show you what happened. Uh, hang on. This is what I was interested in showing you, is the biopsy of the polypoid tissue that we took at the first visit. Mind you, we didn't do this after giving him steroids. We did this at the first visit when he came to our clinic. This is what it showed. There's extensive eosinophilic infiltration, and that's probably the reason why he failed in the first place. And we saw from Sarah Wise's lecture that patients who've got extensive eosinophilia, like more than 10 uh, cells per high power field, they warrant a more aggressive surgery as well. In this case, the decision to do the surgery was not because of the eosinophilia alone, but it was because of the neoosteogenesis in the frontal sinus. And when we did uh, operate on this patient, this is the kind of result we got after two years of sur surgery. I follow up with him even now. Yeah. So this is after two years of surgery. You can see a beautiful frontal sinus. The disease is completely reduced to almost nil. Mm -hmm. And when he came to me, he already had chopped middle turbinates. Uh, he had undergone extensive surgeries in the past. The only thing that was missing from his uh, life was this routine of actually rinsing with butisonide, which I brought in. But of course, uh, the, the butisonide would not have entered his frontal sinus because he had pretty thick neosteogenesis. So this would probably a case, uh, be a case of uh, Lothrops for me. Uh, so the questions that I have to the, the audience members, and I would like to take this opportunity at this point of time to invite one of my other professors, that is Dr. Andrew Swift, who is actually the president-elect of uh, ENT UK now. Hello, Mr. Swift. Hi, Gaurav. Yeah. Uh, I think Dr. Javer uh, sent us a message that he's got operating time, so he's got to leave. So that's okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Javer. Great seeing you all again. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So, uh, Mr. Swift, Hi. my question to you would be, uh, what would you do different from the primary surgeons in this case? So we saw that uh, there was an accessory osteum, the frontal, there was, for, uh, there was quite a significant amount of neosteogenesis. What would you have done different for us to prevent doing the Lothrops in this case? Oh, um, I think you've got to avoid any any accessory osteums where you're going to get circulation of mucus. Um, and you've also got to uh, try to be conservative with your surgery initially so that you're not inducing any osteogenic change. Okay. Um, and it was probably... It comes down to how it was treated medically in the first place, um, you know, which goes back uh, way back in the patient's history. Uh, so you've got to get the the inflammatory effect down to as low as possible and mm. get the drainage maximised. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my question is now to uh, Dr. Naveen Patel, if that's okay. Would you monitor the usage of topical steroids in these patients to rule out adrenal insufficiency? And if yes, how are you going to monitor it? I would definitely uh, you, uh, monitor them for the uh, usage of topical steroids if it is extensively used. Though they are not heavily affecting adrenocortical uh, insufficiency, they don't generate it, but they can. I mean, keep a possibility and and uh, in, in my view, I would take help of a good endocrinologist colleague to rule out uh, adrenocortical insufficiency if I have sufficient symptoms on examination. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Actually, we did this uh, we did this study when uh, in in Canada. Actually, we did two studies. So we have this uh, proof now that uh, uh, long term usage of intranasal butasonide actually causes, uh, there's a 6% chance that your patient might develop raised intraocular pressure without any symptoms. And there's a 3% chance that they may actually have a uh, diminished response on the ACTH stimulation test. So the way to monitor these people is to actually do an ACTH stimulation test, which is actually the gold standard to identify uh, whether or not uh, they are having adrenal insufficiency. The other thing that you could do once in two years is to get a bone scan done. I think this is pretty common practice now in the West, uh, but in India, it, I don't know if we are doing it actively. Probably this should help us change our practice. Thank you, Dr. Naveen. Dr. Gaurav, Dr. Dr. Gaurav. Dr. Murthy would like to take this uh, question. No, no. Dr. Gaurav, I think we're out of time. Okay. So shall we move? Yeah, so shall we move on to Dr. Andrew Swift's uh, lecture then? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I just add one comment with budesonide? And that is that the, there's a, a lack of standardization of dosage here, and budesonide will switch off your adrenal glands, flu, much more so than fluticasone. And the published papers of fluticasone versus budesonide, I think there's about one proper one about fluticasone and lots about budesonide. So it is an area that, that is rife for some research to be done and also standardizing the dose, because if you're putting it in a rinse, you're not delivering that amount of steroid. It's the amount that gets absorbed. Yeah. And it's probably one of the reasons why in the old days, the beta methasone was, not, was um, switching off people's adrenals because they actually swallowed some of it. it. It had a high absorption and it switched off your adrenal glands. But it was so effective, people got locked into it and they kept using it irrespective of what you said as a doctor because it was the only thing that worked so there, there are important things to take to, to understand when you start using topical steroids like this thank you thank you Mr. anyway i will um yeah would you like me to switch screens and go into my talk now yeah i'm gonna stop sharing uh, my i would i would like to thank all our panelists uh, for having contributed uh, thank you one and all Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I will, I will uh, uh, unmute myself and put my video off. It was a really pleasure having, meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you Same so much. Here, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Do you want me to share screens now, Gora? Yes, please. Uh, Gora, would you introduce Dr. Swift? So, uh, Mr. Andrews.
Drift is actually one of the most senior uh, ENT surgeons in the UK right now. And like he, I means, already... he means I'm older than everybody else. <laughs> no, 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 I'm older than anyone else. I mean in terms of knowledge, actually. <laughs> So uh, he's now the president elect of uh, ENT UK, as we all know, which is the uh, which is similar to Association of Otolaryngologists of India for uh, UK. Uh, so uh, he uh, has been a long-term FRCS examiner. In fact, he's written quite a lot of books on how to examine patients. And from my personal experience, actually, he's the one who taught me how to identify these subtle changes that happen in patients with rhinosinusitis issues. Uh, he's uh, quite compulsive when it comes to uh, examining patients, the way things should be done, but I'm very grateful that he did that because uh, it really improved my skill. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Swift. And okay, over here, you, you can, you can uh, share your screen now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Okay, can you see that all right? Is that clear? Hello? Gora? Uh, we can't see your screen yet. Can you see your screen now? No, not yet, actually. Not yet. Yeah. It was, should be sharing. Um, just let me try it again on Zoom. Because we did this yesterday and it did work. So in the bottom part of your screen, there's a share screen. Yeah. You click on Got that it. Got and, it. Choose, and choose your window that you want to share and then say share at the bottom right. Yep. Now we're sharing. Now you're sharing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and take that down. Uh, how's that? Yes. Visible. Yeah. Success. Excellent. Right. Well, Gora, thank you very much indeed for asking me to, to give this talk. Um, it's not the easiest of talks to deliver because everybody is an expert on this uh, in their own way. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just to, to distill some of my observations over the years and to try and give a few hints and tips on, on how best to do it and how to, to um, do it efficiently without missing anything. So the first thing is your learning objectives. I thought I'd put them up there again. And what I'm going to do is go through each one of these in turn. Uh, and at the end of that, which completes the history, we've then got the evaluation and the, the examination. Um, it's good just to be familiar with the latest definition of chronic rhinosinusitis, which is uh, presented very nicely in the new EPOS document. And they've divided it into the primary and secondary. Uh, most of what we see in the, the clinic with the, the long-term problems is, is primary. Um, and then anatomically into a localized disease or diffuse. So most of the time we see diffuse. And then we've got the endotype, which is the, the next step down. Uh, and the endotype is now type two, or there are three types of, uh, that have been defined. There's one, two, and three, but most of them are type two. And rather than saying type one or type three, they said non-type two. So it encompasses all the others. Uh, but the type 2 is mainly your, your eosinophil type of disease. And then looking at the phenotype, which includes things uh, such as your um, granulomatosis with polyangiitis and eosinophilic granulomatosis, the old churg strauss syndrome. So, so that's what we're dealing with now. It's a total rethink in how we, how we classify it. And so the first thing is the perplexing thought, how do you take a history in these patients uh, whilst keeping it interesting and keeping your mind on everything and not missing anything? So a few hints. The, the key things are actually to be engaging, smile and look interested. Um, and I don't know if many of you have been to a doctor recently, but in the UK, it's a new experience. If you go and see your general practitioner, a primary care physician, 
because they have 10 minutes to see you. They'll only see you about one problem. And most of the 10 minutes is spent with them staring at the computer. Um, and you get the distinct feeling they're not really that interested in what you've come about. But, but that is all because they're, they're not interacting directly. They're not maintaining eye contact. They don't let you describe the symptoms within that 10 minutes because you haven't got time. And there's a comment a lot of the patients will say is nobody's ever listened to me before. And we've got to avoid inter going into an interrogation mode. If people aren't forthcoming with the information and you're tight for time, you'll, you, it's so easy to slip into that detective mode and think, right, I'll fire questions at you, just answer yes or no. Um, so that, that's usually non-productive. Um, so it should be easy. And you've only got four main symptoms for chronic rhinosinusitis. Obstruction, discharge with or without face pain and discomfort and similarly for sense of smell. And we're really looking at the nuances of those individual symptoms and the descriptions of them. But in reality, it's not that easy. Uh, and Gaurav will remember from his time in Liverpool how uh, sometimes at the end of the history you still haven't a clue what they're talking about. But you do get people who just can't describe the problem in a logic manner um, and they really struggle and they want to get every single symptom out as quick as possible but they dot around from one bit to another at the end of which you don't know really which where you're going with them. We also see an increasing number of people who are senior in years uh, I missed out the word elderly there, but that was intentional. And, it is, and with the senior years, they collect comorbidities. Um, and so that adds to the complexity of everything. Um, an awful lot of the younger generation have been on the internet. Uh, they've become a, an amateur doctor over the course of several weeks and learned all about what they think they've got. And when you don't quite fit in with their diagnosis, then they start arguing with you. So it gives you a bit of a problem. So internet medicine is not always helpful. And it doesn't give them the, the correct into, insight into the problem that they should acquire. And then distractions in the clinic. If you've got people coming in and out and shuffling things or tidying behind the scenes, it, it alters your concentration. So you've really got to listen carefully and listen to the patient and they will often give you the clues to what's actually wrong with them but um, if you've got distractions going on your mind will will uh, be focused elsewhere and they'll go out of the door and then you'll think oh I forgot to ask them about that and that was such an important question so try and keep those under control so in summary you need it to be logical and systematic um, Ideally, you need to start off by uh, the, the most important top of the pyramid is confirm what their key, state, the key symptoms are and get them to organise it into the most important symptom. And then once you know what the most important symptom to them is, you can start to build on that. Uh, I also check facts because quite often they will have preconceived ideas or beliefs and Yes, when you ask them who, who told that to you, it's, it's often a friend, um, a colleague, it might be their GP, um, but, but it's often uh, information acquired from other sources. Uh, so it's always good to check that you're talking about the right thing. And watch out for the use of multiple terms. Uh, regions will develop dialects and those dialects will include many local words. And they will mean various uh, different things to what you understand. So you've got to start talking the language that the patients are talking. Uh, a typical example of this is nasal crusts. Um, now, nasal crusts locally are described as snot, cobs or bogies, um, all colloquial words. And the one I like most of all is crustaceans. Now, I, unfortunately, I can't see an audience, but at this point, I would have been very tempted to say, so who's used, used the word crustacean to, develop, to describe nasal crusts? And it's really quite amusing because 
an awful lot of doctors use the word crustaceans. That is a crustacean. <laughs> and it's, a, it's an arthropod and it's got a shell and it doesn't live up the nose, but you don't want it up your nose either. So, so it's an important differentiation, but that's just terminology. So we've got certain changes to history taking that have happened in uh, the COVID or post COVID era that we're in now. Um, we are still doing face-to-face -face consultations. We had many weeks without any consultations. Um, at the moment, I'd say about a quarter of our clinics are face-to-face -face, uh, and three quarters are telephone consultations. Uh, so to make it as safe as possible, we do have a screening mechanism so that anyone with COVID suggestive symptoms is prevented from coming to clinic. Uh, we limit the number of people in clinics so that they can sit far apart. The, the distance in the UK is supposed to be two metres, so we've got the distancing factor. Everybody in hospital, patients and doctors, all have to wear face masks. Um, and ideally, you need to be in a room that is very well ventilated. So we do need the windows open, ideally doors open as well, but you do have the confidentiality issues there. Um, but uh, don't sit in a room that, that's uh, completely locked up, no windows and closed door, because that's the worst scenario. Telephone consultations. Well, as I said, 75% of them are telephone now. They've be been a lot more effective than I would have anticipated for reviewing patients, particularly when you know your patient cohort. Um, but they do take as long as a full face-to-face -face consultation. Um, so, uh, they're, but they're still very effective. There are potential risks though when you see a new patient because then you haven't developed a relationship with that patient, you don't know the patient, um, and you, could, you can get a very good history with practice, um, but you can't examine them. So there are potential risks, medically, legally, of missing a serious problem there. Uh, and as long as you, you know about that and you're aware of it, you can, you can compensate. And then you can use the consultation to design your management plan in terms of investigations or preliminary treatment so that you can arrange a face-to-face -face consultation and have the investigations at hand or see the effects of medication. So that can be helpful. Um, other things with the telephone consultations is the quality of the signal. It's not always that easy to listen to people on a bad line. Um, and at, the, at the, the end of a day of doing telephone consultations is more exhausting than face to face because you're actually, your brain is processing only sound. You can't see their, their face, you can't read uh, their, their expressions, and it is harder to understand, especially if there's any degree of background noise. Uh, and if you've got a clinic building where you've got background noise, that's a real hazard. Uh, the other th uh, factor is, although the patients are warned about uh, the fact they're going to get a telephone call, many of them are either at work, they don't answer, or they've got blocks on the phone because in our health service, when we ring out from it, it says call and no ID, so they assume it's a cold caller. And quite often we've got to ring our switchboard who can do that without that sign to see if we can uh, make contact. Um, the tips and pearls there are that you need, for the difficult historian, you need a comprehensive history in a logical order. Even after that, and no matter how hard you try or how many years you've been doing it, it's not always easy. And a, a nice little trick to be aware of is that if you've not got a clear picture at the end of your consulta of, of your history, find a reason to sit the patient outside for five to ten minutes. Uh, a good one is spraying the nose and say the nose the spray takes ten minutes to work, because when they come back in, the, their own brains have filtered the questions into a logical order and they've also filtered it into the, mo the things that bother them most. So they're not trying to get absolutely everything out to you in one go. Another good 
tip is to give them arrange some investigations and then see them again fairly quickly at a second appointment and that often helps and the, the really difficult problem suddenly becomes a lot easier. Um, questions related to other symptoms. It is a very important topic because um, your comorbidities these days can be very uh, complex and they can all interrelate with each other. At the top I've put chest and sleep because for nasal disease the, the chest symptoms and sleep are the most important and many patients with chronic rhinosinusitis will have chest problems and particularly asthma. Um, it's also uh, something very important with sleep quality and particularly obstructive sleep apnea and the use of, um, of CPAP. Uh, continuous positive airway pressure so you need to have a relatively clear nose to use that properly um, but other conditions you need to document them and to understand them because they can all have effects uh, that affect your management and your treatment plans uh, particularly something like diabetes if you want to use oral steroids um, if you've got any uh, cardiovascular disorders that's important uh, if you're planning on surgery and similarly with bleeding disorders or liver disease that will cause bleeding disorders. Um, list in order any previous sinonasal surgery and any other surgery because if they've had a hip replacement then you and you want to get an MRI scan you might find you've got a problem. Uh, so the importance of all of that is one it helps getting an accurate diagnosis but of understanding the diagnosis but it, its main help is when you start to use intervention in medical therapy or planning the surgery. Um, conditions that are associated with chronic rhinosinusitis are well known and um, uh, they include asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, the old SAMHSA's triad which is now uh, got a new name of non eosinophilic res uh, respiratory, or sorry, NSAID, it's non steroidal anti inflammatory with eosinophilia respiratory disease. Um, Im immune deficiency factors are important to think of uh, acid reflux, uh, gastroesophageal reflux, or lar laryngopharyngeal reflux, all very important but often underestimated. Um, and smoking uh, is important as it is, CRS is more, in, more common in smokers. Um, so the tips with this is uh, if you're talking about comorbidities and medications, make sure you get a record of all the medications. Um, the patients will often keep that as a, as a printout from the GP. If they haven't got it and they're on medication, it really gets a bit frustrating because they can never remember the names of things and if you have a guess at the names it's usually the spelt wrongly, spelt incorrectly um, and once you've got that record down and you've put that in a letter you can then transfer the same record across to all the other letters that you do as long as they haven't changed their medication so it is useful to know about. When it comes to nasal medications though, they've often tried medications and, and they'll fire it back to you and say, oh, we've tried all of that, I want an operation. But then when you go into the medications, they'll often fire, they'll use the term nasal spray very loosely, but they won't actually acknowledge which spray it is. And often they haven't tried a, a steroid spray. You want to check that they've used it correctly and not stopped it too early before it could work. Check the technique that they've used it uh, as, because if they're using a spray, some of them think it's uh, like an asthma inhaler and they'll try and inhale it through the nose, which doesn't leave much of the, of the compound left for the nasal mucosa. And then at the end, you need to know, was it effective? Because if the medication worked, then one, you know, it'll work again if you, if you re-prescribe it and often, they don't understand that they've got to continue this long term because it's a long term inflammatory disorder. So you've got, that, got to get that message across so that they comply with the medication as they would do with asthma. 
but for some reason it doesn't happen the same with the nose. Uh, leading questions. Um, the key to the history is one, let them give you a, a, a description in their own words and it's sometimes difficult not to intervene you've got to hold yourself back but then you get to a point where you've actually got to ask leading questions otherwise they won't offer you the information and it's often that they've either it's not high priority or they don't see it being related to the nose problem um, sense of smell you'd think would be quite obvious that they they tell you about that but they don't always do it so don't forget to ask about it um, and the times they're more likely to forget is if it's an incomplete sense of loss of the sense of smell. A, a complete loss of sense of smell that's fairly acute, they'll definitely complain about. Dentition, very important that we know about that, uh, especially with anaesthesia, but also if there's any secondary effects from dental abscesses inducing sinus problems um, and allergy symptoms. It's amazing how many people I say, do you have any allergies? And the answer is no. Do you get hay fever? Yes. <laughs> and then which months do you get hay fever? And they haven't actually realised hay fever is an allergy. Uh, but so, and then go into the pets that they have at home as well. Um, and actually ask about, uh, about allergy symptoms, because often they'll say no to the allergy uh, question. But when you go through allergy symptoms, such as itching, and sneezing etc and blockage in the if you're exposed to certain things then you'll get the true history um, you also need to clarify what they mean by sinusitis it means different things to different people uh, and the specialists we all think we we talk about the same thing but patients just have a much much broader uh, definition of it um, these are all classic things in any medical history but in, for the nose, they're actually very important. Um, occupation, you often get some surprises as to what people are exposed to, although these days it's usually historical exposure, um, such as the dockers in Liverpool that used to work in absolutely terrible conditions. Um, but the home environment as well, do they live actually in the city or outside in urban country um, dwellings? And I had a patient a few months ago that had moved from Liverpool into, into leafy Cheshire and they, they lived close to farmers' fields and they'd had terrible problems with the nose ever since. So that's almost certainly an, aller an allergic type of problem. And whether or not there's a family history, and particularly with uh, polyposis, you often find family members, parents, who suffer from the same problem. Um, so... How to differentiate CRS from other pathology? Well, your, your key symptoms um, are really nasal obstruction, discharge, and often the disease is bilateral. And that part seems relatively straightforward. Uh, but when it comes to facial pain or crusts, then it gets quite woolly. Um, because uh, with the facial pain in particular, because they feel the pain in the face, they automatically assume it's down to sinusitis. Um, and so often you'll end up chasing the, these patients, doing scans and finding no problems with their sinuses. And then they'll say, well, I didn't have pain at the time of the scan. So you, it takes a lot to convince them sometimes that the facial pain is due to other causes and not sinusitis. Uh, and nasal crusts, uh, a lot of people will just get a bit of crusting in the nostrils and they'll call that nasal crusting. Very different to a, a nose where the, the whole nasal cavity is lined with crusts. And particularly, you've got what we call the red flag symptoms. Now, that's um, before I list them, that's one of Gaurav's wonderful pictures uh, before he turned around and ran very quickly in the opposite direction. Uh, but your red flag symptoms that we look for particularly, and if you're on a telephone conversation, uh, consultation, and you have anything like this, you'd arrange for a very urgent appointment within the next week or two. But unilateral obstruction, particularly if it's, if it's a new obstruction, new uh, nasal discharge from just one side with bloodstained mucus, persistent pain on one side and obstruction, Watery discharge could be a CSF leak if it's 
if it's a real watery discharge, particularly position related. And then if you've got any orbital signs or symptoms such as double vision swelling or forehead swelling. So they're all things we, we need to see quickly. Patient uh, reported outcome measures. Um, there are two that are uh, uh, helpful with the history and that is the visual analog scale. Now there are visual analog scales for individual symptoms for the nose but the, the one that's most useful is really the 10 centimeter line for the global uh, events in the nose, the, the global symptom score. Uh, and so that's quite widely used and quite useful and it does correlate very well with the sinonasal outcome test which is the SNOT 22. Uh, there is a, a, a recent one that's got an added question to it as well. Um, and the SNOT um, 22 has certain domains so it asks about some nasal symptoms and some sinus symptoms but also ear related and then it comes on to sleep and the psychological factors and you score each one from zero to five, five being as, as bad as it can get. If you see a patient and they've got lots of fives, particularly over the psychological part, then you know you've got someone who's going to be very difficult to please, but there's usually some underlying background psychological issues going on. So you'd, you'd have alarm bells ringing for surgery uh, and particularly if they've got facial pain and problems like that. So it's a useful screening test not only for the actual score that you get which is marked out of 110 but um, it, it, it alerts you to other, other issues and other problems that you might not have seen without that study. Um, so clinical examination uh, very quickly, I'll just go over some uh, issues, some of the hints on technique. Um, this is how we have to dress these days with a mask on all the time and it steams your glasses up if you don't get the mask on properly. Um, and um, if uh, the, there are recommendations that we should sometimes wear aprons in clinic, a plastic apron with gloves on as well. I think as long as you're taking precautions and you're washing your hands frequently, we don't need to, to go to that length. But if you notice, I, I do have a mask on the patient. Now, that is because it, should the patient cough or sneeze, you are in a firing line. Um, and having the mask over the mouth will help to contain any aerosols. Uh, I'm actually using a Thudicum speculum. I'm sure Gaurav will... Um, uh, remember uh, the time I started infusing about Thudicum or Tudicum and his nasal speculum which he invented in around about 1870 and we still use something that's almost well very very similar to what he designed initially um, and uh, um, it was also interesting listening to the uh, uh, studies that are proposed with the saline rinses because it was all done before by Dr. Tudicum uh, about 130 years ago or 150 years ago now uh, but he did have a few interesting components such as uh, rinsing people out with a bit of cyanide and um, uh, cocaine and, and various uh, other poisons but by and large he did a lot of good work and research on that and he ended up being the father of, of um, metabolic medicine and chemical pathology uh, which is just absolutely incredible uh, looking at the, his achievements. So he wasn't just an ordinary ENT surgeon. So this is the, the Tudicum speculum in action. As you can see from that picture, I've got my hand in contact uh, with Kelly's nose and um, if she moves ahead, it means I'm not going to cause discomfort and the instrument in my hand will move with her. And the other key thing is by putting your hand lightly on their forehead or the top of their head, you can then alter their head position very subtly to get the best view in the nose because it's a directional headlamp. And having the, the patient sat slightly higher stops you 
hunching your back and bending your neck, extending your neck too much. So it's a, a much more restful position. So just little hints on how to do it. Um, and I keep to a routine. Again, it's in, if you don't have a routine, it's very easy to miss a stage. But I, I look at the upper airway uh, completely. Uh, you want to look at the oropharynx because many patients will complain of the post-nasal drip and assume it's a disease of its own entity and they can't live because this is a, such a bad symptom and it's profuse and you have a look in the back of the throat and you can't see any mucus and then you look in the nose and you can't see mucus so it's but it is good to be able to see that if you have a purulent sinus infection and you're getting drainage from that purulent infection you will see mucus in the oropharynx. The other thing to note is the external nose. If someone's complaining of a blocked nose it is very very easy just to dive straight into the nose and you can even get to the point of operating on the nose and then you think there's a saddle deformity. Did I do, did I create that or was that there before? Um, and I'm sure I told Gora of a, of a very interesting medical legal case that I did where someone was sued because they did a septoplasty, they saw the saddle, they felt so guilty about it that they thought they'd better repair it and they took some cartilage from the septum and repaired the saddle. The young lady woke up and said she actually liked the saddle part of her nose and she wanted it put right again and another surgeon had to go back in, take the cartilage out, uh, uh, give her the saddle back and then she went ahead and sued the original surgeon. So it's, and it's so easy to miss that deformity when you come, you, you're dealing with an obstructed nose. Uh, it's not like the patient saying I've got a, a problem with the shape of my nose and then your focus is on the external nose. Um, and then the airway and the internal nose uh, again assessing the airway in the front of the nose without any instruments and then look internally uh, and then we go on to endoscopy now endoscopy interesting scenario because we uh, there was several years ago we used to say the nose the nasal examination isn't complete without an endoscopy and we should be doing this much more often than we sh than, than we are and certainly in my own clinics where we had uh, a, a large selection of endoscopes and the endoscopes were in a in a drawer right next door to uh, right next to the patient it was easy to set up easy to do now we have to go to a separate room uh, COVID has made lots of difference of changes and differences but uh, just before we go into that room if uh, the things that you're looking for with the endoscope are, are the anatomy and also the pathology and there I've got a couple of pictures, one of mucosal edema with, uh, with mucus, excess mucus discharge and polyps. And in the lower picture you can see the creamy discharge coming out from an infected sinus. But this is what we have two endoscopy rooms now um, and they are not pleasant. Uh, they're very hot. We've got a, an extractor fan that's been added which is uh, running all the time. It is noisy. Um, I'm partly responsible for this because I, I did write the documents for ENT UK giving a guidance on how to do endoscopy safely because we had uh, had a colleague who died from COVID in the early days and then we had a couple in ITU. So uh, COVID was, we were frontline workers. We were, we were exposed to the problem and it was downplayed and downregulated by all the authorities. So we did win that argument but the consequences are that we now have extractor fans in our endoscopy room um, and we've got to minimize the number of people in the room which is difficult if you're teaching. Uh, the room uh, it was very hot because there's zero open ventilation but they won't keep the doors open even though the airflow is through the doors because people are just they, they become illogical and they get very concerned and worried in case a, a tiny virus particle escapes. Um, what we're concerned about is the aerosol produced and the aerosol 
uh, is something of micro aerosols are things that can lay, uh, keep in the air in a suspension for several hours afterwards which is why you need a room that's well ventilated. The large aerosols fall within two to three feet of the patient onto, the, onto surfaces and onto the floor. So they're not the issue, it's the small micro aerosols. The endoscopy is a potential aerosol generating procedure. So it's not going to generate aerosols in every single case. And as long as you're protected in case there is an aerosol, so we use a full uh, PPE, which is a visor, an impervious gown, gloves, and the, the high-level FFP3 mask. Um, so if you do get a patient that is one is positive and has sneaked through the screening system and then sneezes, um, then you're in the firing line. But if you keep the mask on the patient at the time and just have the mask either underneath the nose or make a hole in the mask, then if they do sneeze or cough, you're not going to get exposed to a large aerosol. Um, coughing generates not that much more aerosol than talking loudly. Sneezing is very different. And so what you want to do is avoid inducing a sneeze. So actually asking the pa telling the patient that this is the issue, this is the problem, and saying, if you are going to sneeze, let me know, suppress it qu if you can, and give me warning. And that means that you, you can stay very safe and, and the other people in the room, if anyone else is there, will be safe. Um, evaluating the scans very, very quickly. Um, I always look at the report, the official report, um, and I review the images myself. Uh, and legally that keeps you safe because I've seen too many cases where a report has been done and there's reference to something like a dental abscess and the patient goes away uh, and they haven't, they haven't got sinusitis but they've got facial pain. Uh, and then the dental abscess is uh, spotted by someone else and the patient has treatment and then the facial pain disappears. That patient then puts a claim in for the months or years that they've had pain. So it's always worthwhile aligning the report with the images. Um, and the other thing you can do with the images is talk them through with the patient and it's much easier to explain things if they've got a visual image to see rather than just um, giving t talking to them. Uh, if you're on the receiving end you, you often listen but you don't process or you don't take it in so we assume that pa patients are understanding when they're not. If they see an image of it they'll remember that much more. Very quickly Gaurav did want me to mention nasal physiology. I, I'm lucky in that I have the equipment in clinic and we use it primarily for uh, clinical information rather than research uh, and the the test that I'm doing is a combination of things um, but it's rhino manometry with spy rhino spirometry acoustic rhinometry and the peak nasal inspiratory flow now the the PNIF is a is a, a, a relatively old very established test you're looking at the maximum inspiration um, and that means you've got to get the patient to uh, to actually put in that effort. It's a very effort-related test. And it's really surprising how many people you think they would have done better than they do do. And, and, um, and it doesn't quite add up to the other tests that you've got. So you've got to know how to interpret them. Um, but the other studies, um, if we look at this test here. This is a, a series of tests that uh, the patient was um, complaining of, an, of nasal obstruction but after vasoconstricting the nose and doing this test we've got relatively normal results. Um, if I uh, show you the flow loop, um, the, the pressure flow loop there, um, that's a, a normal looking curve uh, and that's for the left side of the nose, that's for the right side of the nose, so very similar for both sides. The acoustic rhinometry is looking for deflections and um, uh, so you're putting a clicking sound into the, the nose and then the, 
uh, electronics picks up the reflection. And here we've got a relatively normal curve um, and the rhino spirometry is assessing the balance between the preferred sides of the nose, the right and the left side. And you can see that's relatively equal. If we now move on to someone with a bad septal deviation, you can instantly see the, the, cur the curve here is much more vertical. This one's much more horizontal and the resistance values are, are much greater. But on the acoustic rhinometry, there's the reflection from the anterior cartil cartilaginous deviation. And if you compare that to the other side, it's a big difference. And then the spirometry, we've got the, um, uh, the preferred side being the right side of the nose. So just to finish off a couple of slides, we've, we've got a whole load of information to evaluate and assimilate. Um, and then you've got challenges that you've got to, to rise to. So you've got to address the patient's expectations, not only trying to get them to prioritise what their problems and their symptoms are, you need to know what they expect to happen and what is going to be success in their eyes. Uh, unfortunately, there are, um, their expectations are often vastly higher than ours because they don't understand the pathology or the disorders and they've been on the internet, they've, they've um, self-diagnosed themselves and they think that that's dead easy to fix. They come along and they expect you to fix it very quickly. And if you don't do that, then you're not a very good doctor, so they'll go and see somebody else. We've also got the media that doesn't help all the, uh, our profession all the time because they make things look easy, um, particularly videos and things on the internet that, that um, make every operation seem as if uh, you, you know, a two-week course and you'd be able to do it. And then we've got a general loss of trust and respect for professionalism. So they don't trust you as much as what patients used to trust us 20 years ago. Uh, that's an age-related phenomenon because the, the senior people in society, and particularly the elderly, will, will completely trust your word and they'll put faith in you. The younger people, because they see medicine as being very very quick, very easy, and if it can't be fixed easily, then you're not a good doctor. And that's where we have the problem. So sometimes it does take um, several meetings with the patient to win them over so that they understand you are doing your best for them, um, and that's as much as you can expect. Uh, but it's very interesting when you start to think of these things. Um, you've got clinical decisions to make. You've got lots of information, especially from a rhinological history in a complex uh, patient with m many other things going on. So we've got the medical treatment, the surgery, and whether we go ahead with surgery. Now, I've put medical treatment increased role because one of the things that has happened with COVID is that we have lost ability to gain access to theatres like we used to. Um, and for ourselves, we've, most of the surgery now is cancer surgery and it's advanced cancer surgery now because the patients have almost gone beyond operating on. Um, so the people with sinusitis are way down in importance uh, in terms of the resources that we have uh, that are accessible. So my own practice is moving more and more to medical treatment and making it even more intensive so that we're, we're avoiding surgery if possible. Um, in terms of evaluating for surgery, then there are, other, apart from the access to theatre, which is very, very limited, we don't want to be putting people on a list that's going to last for two to three years before they can have an operation. So you've got to decide, is it essential or can it be safely deferred or can it be avoided? Um, and as I say, a lot of surgery can now be deferred and avoided. Um, also, the patients often don't want to go ahead with surgery because they perceive hospitals as being risky places for, for the SARS-CoV virus. Um, and there are additional risks with that. So if you come to hospital and you happen to develop the SARS-CoV virus, 
you you may find that well your recovery will certainly be far from straightforward um, the neurosurgeons are now quoting 20 percent death rate if they get the sars cov virus in the recovery period and that's probably um, because of the, the major surgery that they're doing uh, but it, it will put the patient at undue risk and we've now got to have that conversation with patients um, before we admit them for surgery so they have a full understanding as to what they're letting themselves in for and what the additional risks are. Uh, so the tips for your future practice always try to establish an accurate diagnosis but that's more likely to happen if you can keep to a system where you don't actually forget to, to ask something really important and, and uh, major and it should be clear, logical and comprehensive. And if you're still not clear at the end of that, reevaluate the patient. Uh, there's no harm in seeing anyone again. Uh, and if you're not certain, you can always admit the uncertainty, explain the reason for the uncertainty, explain what the other possibilities are, but always have a plan ready. Um, what you've got to do is give them comfort confidence in your competence don't make them think you don't know what you're doing and so you, you your prime aim is to win their confidence and win their trust uh, and with that uh, it brings me to another of Gaurav's amazing pictures he, he goes out and takes these things and uh, the, it looks like that, that jumping spider has been listening to every word um, but just to bring you back to reality, well, that's one of mine on another crustacean in the Galapagos Islands. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Swift. Thank you. Like a true, I, I... Like a true teacher, you have <laughs> gone through every step. Uh, Great. Well, I it was a pleasure you listening to you. Day. It was a pleasure listening to you. Thank and you. Thanks for a wonderful session. Uh, thank you very much. I'll just put it on to the other two. Um, and I need this stuff. Right. So we're done. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Uh, and it, I think I've still got an audience. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm here. <laughs> if, if any one of our panelists want to ask any question, the um, yeah. screen is open for you. Dr. Meghanad, Dr. Naveen Patel, Dr. Neelam. I don't think they're online right now. Okay. <laughs> we are start with the uh, live surgical demonstration. Mr. Swift, if uh, you want to uh, be as one of our moderators for the live surgery, we would be more than happy to have you on board with us. Okay. And maybe you can uh, get your... All right for the next half an hour, Gaurav. That's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I'll take leave, Gaurav. Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Srinivas Muthi, for uh, moderating the session. It was wonderful having you with us. Thank you. Uh, I think Dr. Satish Jain is going to take over and discuss about the CT scan for the patient. Uh, it's a fungal ball that we're doing now, and followed by an allergy from the rhinus case. Thank you, Gaurav. On, uh, like Gaurav said before, we are starting this live surgical chain. Like last week, we have seen what Professor uh, Richard Harvey mentioned about the e 2020 classification. So we are starting with the basics. Two cases today, according to the e 20, in the primary category, primary limited primary diffuse. That's for the two cases today. So the first case being the primary limited is a fungal ball. You know, there are very few, uh, you know, examples for the primary limited. It could be allergic fungal sinusitis. Sinusitis for the primary limited once it involves one sinus. Or it could be because of the fungal ball limiting to the one sinus. So, the indications are obvious. Once it is a fungus, it is an indication for surgery as simple as that. Let me take you through to the CT scan findings of this first patient. Connect, Karna. Please connect my laptop. 
so this is a uh, you know 32 year old female with some symptoms of fullness obstruction discharge and all these things on the left side and once the ct scan was done this was upfront ct scan we discussed in the beginning about the value of the upfront and the delayed ct scan and this is one of the classic examples of upfront ct scan share karna see a laptop the one of the classic example of the upfront ct scan the reason being knowing the fungus being there if you keep on doing medical treatment is something not required so uh, i hope you are getting the ct on the screen are you getting the ct on the screen this is the bone window setting ct scan showing disease in the left maxillary sinus if i reconstruct on the coronal image see this this is a disease involving the left maxillary sinus with some heterogeneous opacities you can't define on a bone window then we go into the soft tissue window and what you see in the soft tissue is better than the bone window showing these heterogeneous opacities much better on the coronal we can appreciate this image to understand it see this this heterogeneous opacity with some secretions behind giving this patient symptoms persistently and being a fungus no medical treatment is going to help her to cure this problem so this is a straightforward indication for surgery for a limited surgery once you have a fungal ball mycetoma in one side of the sinus you just all what all you need to do is to open up the sinus to establish the ventilation and drainage clear off this fungal ball and this uh, you know bad mucosa whatever it has become polypoidal or secretions whatever and establish the ventilation and drain this is what all required for this patient to begin with with a very very basic case primary limited limited to one sinus and what all need is a you know endoscopic sinus surgery limited towards the left maxillary sinus which uh, you know gorav is going to start can you can you change to the endoscopic picture please professor swift any comments yeah it, it looks a, a very straightforward problem and the access Absolutely. on that side of the nose is very good um so surgery is very in that situation is very low risk mm -hmm. and, it, and it's relative is a very straightforward case yes absolutely uh, yeah. and this is what uh the team got up kept uh before starting this series of webinars to start with the basics and moving towards the advanced one yeah. and in this live surgical series this is the most basic case to start with with the primary you know crs with a limited disease and uh, that's the classic example can you connect to the endoscopic picture please audio visual i think the other important thing to notice is the integrity of the bone around the sinus hope you are getting the endoscopic picture are you getting the endoscopic picture hello I've got a very clear view of it. Yes. Yes, Gaurav? sir. We can see that. Gaurav, you are on. Can you hear Gaurav? Can you hear Gaurav? Can you all hear me? Hello. Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Okay. Gaurav, Gaurav, not me. Are you Are you seeing the picture? No, no, can you hear Gaurav? It's coming from there. On, no? On. Gaurav, can you see something? Can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah, Gaurav, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Great. So, now, uh, are you guys getting the endoscopic picture? Yes, we are getting your endoscopic picture. 
Okay, that's fine. So now what we're trying to do is we've got a patient here with an, uh, like Dr. Satish Jain explained, we've got a patient with an isolated maxillary sinus disease. So this is most probably a fungal ball. Uh, so what we want to do is, uh, the first thing we want to do is create a good access. So this patient has got a very gross septal deviation to the right side. So I'm going to do a quick septoplasty. Number eight suction is here. Once we finish a quick endoscopic septoplasty, we're going to proceed to doing the maxillary sinus disease. So the trick to doing a good endoscopic septoplasty is to get the perfect plane right from the start. So what I like to do is I like to lift the nasal valve and you can see that this is the squamocolumnar junction. At the junction, I would like to make this incision here. And I like to come all the way down, straight down onto the nasal floor. Once I've done that, with the reverse, I just reverse the blade and I make a couple of quick incisions onto the mucopericondrium. Once I do that, I switch to a suction, a number is suction to be specific, and I just lift this mucoperiosteum or mucopericondrium actually. with our suction itself. So as you can see, I'm already in a wonderful plane right now. So this gives me a very good plane of dissection. The trick is in actually getting good infiltration into this plane. If you have good infiltration, then it shouldn't be a problem for you to get this plane. So within two minutes, I'm actually in my field, in my plane of dissection. Now, this is the tricky part. That is the junction between the bone and the cartilage. Elevator there. This is where we can actually tear the flap. So I would like to use the elevator and scrape off of the periosteum, off of the bone. Once we do that, now you can clearly see this bony cartilaginous junction here, okay? If you have any doubts, then the best thing to do is actually feel it. Okay? So now what we're gonna do is, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, sir. We are just gonna fracture this bony cartilaginous junction. As you can see. And now I'm onto the other side. As you can see, so we have successfully separated this bony cartilage junction. Quite a bad deviation that we have. Can you all see this? What a watch. Yeah. Okay. So once we finish this, suction elevator then, suction elevator, suction elevator. One second. Okay. Lux process is So once we finish this, all we got to do is go in, scissors again. Make sure that you've elevated this mucosa completely because you don't want this mucosa to rip. Okay? So you don't want any of this mucosa to tear and rip and damage and create a septal perforation. 
okay posteriorly the bone is going to be pretty thin so then what i do is i leave a good amount of bone above and i just cut through it and then we can go in with the lux forceps and twist it and take it up लक्स है क्या वही पूछ रहा था मैं लक्स ओके सो नाउ दैट वी हैव क्रिएटेड गुड अमाउंट ऑफ स्पेस व्हाट यू वांट टू डू इज गो बैक एंड चेक इफ दिस अमाउंट ऑफ स्पेस इज इनफ इफ यू फील दैट इट्स इनफ देन दिस इज व्हेयर वी स्टॉप बिकॉज़ वी आर डूइंग द सेप्टोप्लास्टी मेनली फॉर एक्सेस ओके So now what we would like to do is, so this mucosa is going to be a little sloppy. There's nothing to worry about it because this is mucosa which is stretched out. We will create some amount of space in the middle meatus for ourselves in order to successfully open this sinus. As you can see through the accessory ostium, there's already some fungus that's pouring out. Okay, so this seems like decent amount of space for us to work in. So what I'm going to do now is back bite on. Okay. Just going to decongest this space a little more. Suction. And once we have adequate amount of decongestion, then I'm going to open up the maxillary sinus. So the first step is to do an ansinectomy. So this is a pretty nice antenate process that we can see. Let me just reorientate you to this. We have the inferior turbinate here. We have the accessory ostium of the maxillary sinus. You can see there's quite a lot of fussy discharge that's coming out. This is the middle turbinate, the attachment of the middle turbinate to the lateral wall. This is the bulbous part of the middle turbinate. This is the uppermost part of the middle turbinate which is attaching to the skull base. Okay? So my uh, meris cell is actually in the middle meatus now. what you can see here is the antenate process so this is the antenate process here so it's got three parts we have the vertical segment the intermediate segment and the horizontal segment ideally you want to open the antenate process at the junction between the intermediate and the horizontal segment that is somewhere here this is where you will find the infundibular ethmoidalis where the maxillary sinus actually opens this is the bulla ethmoidalis which goes vertically upwards towards the skull base So now we're going to use a back bite of forceps. Once we reach the antenate process, we can actually enter behind the antenate process, turn it downwards, and then take a good bite. Now the reason why we want to do this, we want to turn it downwards, is because if you take a look at the name, my little ball prop. If you look at the uh, the nasal acromal duct. so this bulge is actually the nasal acromal duct so if you look at where i went and if you turn it downwards you're actually much farther away from the nasal acromal duct than when you're here so if i'm closer to the nasal acromal duct above my chances of injuring it are much higher whereas if i'm lower down my chances of injuring it are much lower so this is actually the infundibulum ethmoidale you can see that this is quite an inflamed infected sinus okay एक सेकंड एक सेकंड एक सेकंड मैं अंदर मत घुसना ऐसे एक सेकंड कैन आई हैव अ जे किरेट प्लीज सो व्हाट आई एम गोइंग टू डू नाउ इज आई एम गोइंग टू जस्ट फ्रैक्चर दिस अनसेनेट प्रोसेस विद द हेल्प ऑफ अ जे किरेट debrider please so now we're going to use a debrider suction ban kar and now you can see that we are opening up straight into the maxillary sinus so what i'm doing is i'm following the antenate process all the way up 
to make sure that I get a good complete ansonectomy. It's very important to realize that the ansonectomy process can actually be quite close to the lamina papyracea. So we have the horizontal part of the ansonectomy process bone stuck up here. Because of the inflammation, it's quite fibrous and there is significant amount of osteitis. So you can start seeing the fungal ball now, which is coming to view. And along with that, you can see quite a lot of purulent neutrophilic sort of uh, infiltrated uh, mucus. Upturn Blake. See how predictive the CT scan is. This is distant from allergic fungal sinusitis. The next case is allergic fungal sinusitis, which is altogether a different pathology. This is simple fungal accumulation with no mucosal reaction. And the next one is pure hypersensitivity to the fungus with mucosal reaction. So there are a variety of fungal situations, and this is one of the most basic ones. So what I'm trying to do is now get this unsynic process out of the way, the bone especially, and then I can divide the mucosa out. Upturn break you know? So my goal is to try and get that piece of bone alone. I don't want to pull any of the mucosa out because we need to preserve as much mucosa as possible in this case. Okay. So since the disease is limited only to the lower part, that is to the maxillary sinus, I'm not going to remove the upper part of the unsinic process because it's not really necessary in this case. So we are trying to be as conservative as possible in our surgery because this is a single sinus disease. Wash. So far, what you do is with a simple wide angle zero degree. This is a remnant of the unseenness. Blackly, then. So blackly. Up turn blackly, then. So I'm just trying to get that piece of bone out. The bridal, please. Questions for link here, separate. Computer, sir. So now you can see that we've completed our ansinectomy beautifully, and we've done our middle metal androstomy as well. So here, one of the things that I would like to point out is not to be too aggressive as you go behind because this is what actually causes a lot of mucus recirculation in these cases suction medical curve suction pe wash laga ke den so especially close to the maxillary sinus posterior wall if you start taking out of a, of a lot of uh, mucosa there then you are bound to have mucus recirculation in fact, Richard Orlandi is going to talk about it in uh, one of our uh, webinars, which is on uh, maxillary sinus itself. So Richard Orlandi is covering our maxillary sinus session. So he's going to talk about how to identify mucus recirculation, how to prevent it, and if at all you have it, then how to treat it. So you can see this is pretty thick literally like a stone, right? This is classic of a fungal ball, Jekirat Dana. One of the most important tools in our toolkit for this sort of situation is to use a Jekirat. It's quite easy to get this out with a Jekirat. So it's important that both your hands have to follow 
one after the other. One hand leads and the other hand follows. Now in this sort of situation, there's two things that you can do. Either you watch with warm saline, which actually brings out all of that material out, or you can use hydrogen peroxide to actually thin this gunky stuff. It actually becomes quite thin and then easier to get out as well. All the substance. Very good. Really good. I think one of the most important tools in our armamentarium for this procedure would be a good suction. And I can certainly say I'm working with one of the best suctions that is possibly available right now, actually. Can you hear me? Gaurav? Hello? So after doing this, right now, watch this. It probably looks like the maxillary sinus is clear. But we have to confirm at this point of time with a 70 degree scope. It's a little bit of a fungus is there. It is very important to confirm with a 70 degree scope whether or not you have actually completely removed all the fungus. Because leaving any amount of fungus in this sort of situation would actually mean under treating the disease. 70 scope. So we're going to switch to a. Gaurav. Gaurav. Yes. Gaurav, Andrew has a uh, point for you. Dr. Andrew, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Gaurav, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you now. Right. I'm going to have to go in five minutes, but what I'm interested in is how do you um, manage someone post operatively with this problem? Uh, because what, what do you do if you see them in clinic and they've got a further collection? Um, or particularly if it's the sphenoid sinus where you rescan and you sudden and you see that the, the disease is still lurking there in the, in the background. So how do you manage that type of problem? So this patient's got a single sinus disease. So what we would do is try to keep the sinonasal corridor as patent as possible and then keep an eye on her maxillary sinus at the moment. Uh, are you talking about sphenoid sinus involvement in this patient or? Yeah, in... yeah well, the, the sphenoid's more of, of a problem to control uh, in the long term than the maxillary sinus. So, uh, and the irrigation to a maxillary sinus is a lot easier. But yeah. say for the sphenoid sinus and, it, and you keep getting recurrent problems. It okay. doesn't. It doesn't necessarily cause symptoms, but you can see with the, either the endoscope or the or, or the post-operative scans that yeah. there is still some debris in the sinus that keeps recollecting. So in how do you what go we about do is that? We could actually create a waterfall sort of a situation where we drill down the floor of the sphenoid sinus and allow it to drain downwards, if that's necessary. Yeah, what about the sphenoid that extends laterally? Uh, in that case, we would have to do a trans approach and sort of uh, open up that space so that yeah. waters can reach up there. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Swift. So as you can see here, we've got quite a clear maxillary sinus right now, and it's completely mucosalized. You can see the whole lining of the maxillary sinus is intact. So I wouldn't want to damage any of the mucosa anymore. This is a single sinus disease. We don't need to do anything more than this. This is a limited disease. And we have left the bulla intact, as you can see. And I would leave the condition at this right now. The upper part of the uncinate is left intact. In case she needs any kind of surgery in the future, we have another landmark to go to the frontal sinus in that case. And this is a fantastic um, big antrostomy. And I'm pretty sure that you should be able to wash her sinuses with this. So I think Dr. Uh, Satish Jain can actually discuss the CT scan for the next case, which is the unilateral fungal sinusitis case. Satish was. Fungal sinus ka scan padna. Okay, thanks, Gaurav. So, uh, if I'm audible.
I'm just going to have to go. So thank you very much, uh, all of you, for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure uh, and a fantastic event. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swift. Bye. It was a pleasure having you. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello. Hello. So, thank you, Gora, and uh, pleasure to have you again. And the next case, again, like uh, I previously mentioned, this is a primary and one of the classical examples is allergic metal rhinosinusitis. Well, uh, if you remember, in today's lecture, like Dr. Kala always mentioned about the features, classical features of allergic fungal rhinosinusitis are uh, like described with Benton Coons, where you see the classical, besides the polyps in the patient, you see the classical radiological feature of heterogeneous density in the paranasal sinuses, which is classical of allergic fungal sinusitis. This is a bone window setting where you can see the bone's prominence, but not the soft tissue windows. So if I take you to the soft tissue windows, I'm thankful to Gaurav for coming all the way to Jaipur. I told him we can uh, connect with the live surgical program if you happen to be in Jaipur with this series and see on the soft tissue windows. Can you see this? The heterogeneous densities on the right side of the ethmoidal complex. And what you infer out of this is the maxillary sinus is simply harboring mucus, you know, the redundant secretions. The pent up secretions, what you see, I'll take. Hey, refresh karna. Yes. Hmm? And see the hydrogenous densities in the ethmoids. If I go behind, see this all the way right into the post ethmoid, and the sphenoid is almost clear with little bit of the mucosal hypertrophy. So, this is one of the classical features of AFRS. To be in young patients, unilateral, with these densities, with, you know, polyps, and along with this, the other features of bent of Kunar, it's a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction to the fungus. So what you need to prove is fungus on the smear to establish the diagnosis. That too, not invading the mucosa anywhere. This is absolutely non-invasive fungus, which is basically a classical reaction of the patient to the fungal antigen. This is what we see in this patient. And anteriorly, the, the frontal sinus being very, very small on this side as compared to the opposite side. But what we see is a separate intersinus septal cell, which is communicated to the ethmoidal complex and the same side frontal sinus. That is something you need to pick up on this dynamic radiology. That is important, important finding that you need to corroborate during surgery as well. And what is this is a simple uh, situation. One step ahead than the previous one, which was a localized one, and it is a diffuse one with a different pathophysiology. That's a different endotype of CRS. As uh, we discussed several times, the CRS is different endotypes, and this is one of the classical examples of allergic fungal sinusitis. Uh, Gaurav, are you ready? Yeah, we're just decongesting. Okay, in a minute's time? Yeah. Okay, the, we can take meantime some uh, couple of questions. The one from Dr. Sachin Shil Parker from Lalitpur, what's the dilution concentration of hydrogen peroxide of for irrigation, hydrogen peroxide is never used for irrigation in the nose. For that matter, for the chronic sinusitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, uh, regarding the Dr. Asmita Patel debated nasal septum is already corrected. Compliments to Dr. Swift for the great lecture.
when monte lucas to be added to crs treatment with or without polyp from uh, dr dp padma raju from hyderabad monte lucas is never used as a first line treatment for crs and that to without polyp is never so this is something very very clear manu kahani is a, obviously will discuss later on in the upcoming webinar it's a one of the strongest anti biofilm major uh, you know agent and it can be used in a situation when the biofilms are the major cause of you know recalcitrant sinusitis regarding ige ige measurement has certain advantages number 1 if the ige is low in a sinusitis setting one can think of macrolides as a first line measurement you know uh, first line management rather than going in for surgery if ige is high this could be because of certain reasons like could be because of allergy or could be because of step or yes you know hypothesis which leads to polyglonal expansion of the ig so both need to be kept in mind and both are you know situations leading to recalcitrant sinusitis so if ig is high you have to be prepared and you need to counsel your patient as well next question from dr girish umrekar from bilai regarding the basement membrane thickness in histopathology whether it has clinical implication yes basement membrane thickness denotes the chronic remodeling and that is quite common in you know the eosinophilic rhinosinusitis this is one of the indication for the need of the long term you know post operative irrigation so this is very very important parameter next question is uh, any role of nasal drop like oxymetazoline in polyposis uh, no way oxymetazoline use should be discouraged for long term use and this question for the polyposis is something uh, i would say never next one from udaipur from our dear friend dr navneet mathur hi navneet this is uh, regarding dose of macrolide and the duration and which one ready gara so gara is ready after this so our preferred macrolide is the clarithromycin and uh, the dose and duration like we discussed during the past you know uh, webinar is a low dose macrolide for long term the preferred one is the clarithromycin clarithromycin in the dose setting of 250 mg a day for few months like 3 to 4 months minimum and then assess the response we'll take up questions later as you progress now gorav is on with the uh, you know endoscopic picture and oh, as you can see, see is this g the classical incipitant mucus this is absolutely different from the previous fungal situation see this is pure eosinophilic material what you see is pure eosinophilic material around the fungus and that is the hallmark of this disease allergic fungal rhinosinusitis is a pure type 1 reaction to the fungal antigen so uh, as as dr satish jain explained you can actually see that this is the classical finding what you can look at 12 o'clock now you can see that there's quite a lot of thick glue like or peanut butter jelly like uh, consistency of the mucus substance of this So what we're going to do now is uh, we've actually created a good uh, space for all the blood to trickle down. In this case, you'll observe one thing for sure is that there's going to be quite a lot of bleeding until the fungus is out. And the minute the fungus gets out, the bleeding is all going to stop. So we're going to just debride all this polyposis. So this is one of the cases of CRS with polyps, which is actually associated with allergy. So the other condition which is actually associated with allergy is actually CCAD, where you find polyposis, but it's not grossly involving uh, uh, the sinuses except in the central compartment. So now you start seeing the uh, uncinate process in view. The uncinate process is actually quite averted. So we're going to take a back biter now, and we're going to try and sort of create space for ourselves in order to enter into the maxillary sinus where we have significant amount of uh, secondary disease we don't have a lot of fungus in this case but we do have secondary involvement of the maxillary sinus 
because of uh, inflammation as well as obstruction of the sinus. Balto, please. So now we identified the infundibulum like in the last case, and now you can see that I'm actually inside the maxillary sinus. I'm just opening up the maxillary sinus. Like I said, there's going to be quite a bit of bleeding in this situation. Nothing to worry. As soon as the fungus is out, this disease, is, uh, the bleeding is actually going to come down drastically. Uh, just keep an eye out for the amount of bleeding that we have right now. So you can see that the polyps inside the maxillary suction bundle are actually maxillary sinus are now coming out in view. They're coming out to play with us. It's quite a big polyp that we have there. So it's quite important to remember not to touch the lamina or the uncinate process in this sort of situation because it's quite close to the lamina preparation. Okay? So as you can see, I am inside the maxillary sinus now. One doctor. What? Up later, you question the echo. So now we're just trying to open up the uh, maxillary sinus by removing the horizontal and intermediate part of the uncinate process with a 40 rod debrider blade. As you can see, that is the bone of the horizontal part of the uncinate process. Can I have an upturned Blakesley, please? So this process is sort of repetitive as to what we did in the previous case, like as in the fungal balls. My goal is to just hold on to the bone and try to remove only the bone and not any kind of any mucosa if I can help it. What? 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 So that's the upper part of the uncinate process that we're just getting in view now. We try to do a complete resection of the uncinate process as much as possible. That's the vertical part of the uncinate process bone. Back by it. You can start seeing that the fungus is coming into view. Suction. Back by it. So I'm just gonna complete my uncinectomy by removing a little bit more of the uncinate process here. Sorry, this backfighter is not very sharp. I'm going to try my best to do it as atraumatically as possible. Yeah. Okay. So now what I do is, Jekira, please. Jekira. So now what I do is, I go in and I actually try to remove as much of the ethmoid as possible along with the fungus. We're getting quite a lot of the fungus out. So most of the fungus is actually situated in the ethmoid cavity, as you can see. So I'm staying as in the midline as possible because I don't want to damage the uh, lamina in the process of trying to remove the fungus. So now we're going to try and do the ethmoidectomy. So we're doing the antithmoidectomy, and in the same uh, in the same process, we are actually also removing the fungus as well. So the good thing here is I've got a terrific suction attached to this debrider, 
and I'm able to finish a lot of my work with just one instrument rather than having to use a separate suction. Uh, so the goal of surgery in these cases, especially in AFRS, would be to create a very wide opening, even in the maxillary sinus as well as in the sphenoethmoid recess. So we need to create a sinonasal corridor that is big enough to allow post-operative uh, irrigation, to allow post-operative surveillance as well, because these are patients who can come back with disease at any point of time. Watch, please. So like I was mentioning, there's going to be a little bit of a trickle. As in when we start clearing out the fungus, you will see that this trickle is going to stop. Uh, one of the most important things that you have to remember is the goal of surgery here. There are actually four or five goals of surgery in case of allergic fungal sinusitis. The first one is to reduce the antigen load. So allergic fungal sinusitis, as the name suggests, is actually an allergic response or a hypersensitivity response to the fungal antigen. Okay? So as long as the fungal antigen is sitting in place, you will not be able to cure this disease. So the first goal of surgery is to remove absolutely 100% of the fungal antigen material from this patient's nose. So in order to achieve that, you have to open up all the sinuses, all the cells completely on this side of the nasal cavity. That is on the right side that we are operating right now. Second goal of surgery. So unless you reduce the fungal loads, none of the other therapies are going to work. Whether you ask the patient to do rinsing, whether you ask the patient to do... Uh, whether you ask the patient to do... Uh, Immunotherapy is not going to work because you've got fungal antigen sitting right inside the nostrils. So until and unless the first goal of surgery is met, which is, which is actually removal of the fungal antigen, nothing else is going to work. Immunotherapy works only in adjunct to surgery. It doesn't work on its own. So this is the middle turbinate, as you can see. I'm creating a very wide maxillary antrostomy here. The reason why we go wide in these cases is because these patients actually have absolutely defective mucociliary motility after having such an extensive disease. Okay? So what happens in these cases, Panita, is that their mucociliary clearance is sort of uh, uh, completely knocked out because of long-standing inflammatory disease. And in fact, these patients are the ones who actually eventually go and develop uh, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis as well. Now, I usually get a lot of questions that is there a role for oral uh, fungal, uh, antifungals in these patients? In the post-operative period, there is absolutely no role for oral antifungals in these patients. Uh, there are certain studies which actually do mention that there is some amount of improvement, if not complete improvement in these patients. But it must be remembered that probably there are a small subset of patients with specific uh, genotypes, which, uh, and these patients may not be representing the whole population of allergic fungal sinusitis. So in the preoperative period also, some of the studies have mentioned there are to be specific two studies which have mentioned that there is significant improvement uh, with uh, oral antifungals in the preoperative period. So in these cases, uh, uh, some amount, in the sense that there is some amount of reduction in inflammation as well as some amount of uh, reduction in the endoscopic score as well uh, when we give preoperative period. So now if you look at the roof of the maxillary wash, Roof of the maxillary sinus, and if I draw a line perpendicular to that, just medial to the middle turbinate, that is where I would like to enter my posterior ethmoidal cell. So my goal right now would be to do a complete posterior ethmoidectomy. So my surgical, although my most of my surgical training has happened with uh, Dr. Satish Jain. I follow a slightly different route right now. 
So I try to preserve the superior turbinate if I can. The reason why I do that, and of course it's not proven, it's just for my own satisfaction, uh, is to try and preserve as much olfactory mucosa as I can. Now the reason why I do that is because it has been proven by research, by an anatomical study, that the posterior part of the superior turbinate actually has the highest density of olfactory neurofibers. Okay, when you compare the superior turbinate and the middle turbinate, it is the posterior part of the superior turbinate which actually has highest number of olfactory fibers. And that's the reason why I try to preserve as much as the superior turbinate as I can. Of course, there is no proof that doing this actually changes olfaction in any way. In fact, I think there was a study by, I mean, uh, by Andrew Tambu, uh, who is also from St. Paul Sinus Center, uh, who did a study by doing two different uh, approaches to the uh, sphenoid sinus and found that it didn't make a lot of difference in terms of olfaction. But like I said, if I can preserve any mucosal surface, I would like to do that in these patients. Okay, so now we need to find our sphenoid sinus. Can I get a straight black slip? Straight black slip. Up to the dead of the So I'm just going to remove this piece of bone here. So you have to observe that I try and remove only the bone and never the mucosal lining. Pocha, then? Pocha, pocha. So my goal here would be to actually identify the sphenoid sinus and then go retrograde into the frontal. This is the tricky bit because you don't want to damage the middle turbinate and make it unstable right now. Up turn, black side, then. I'm just going to clear up the, uh, the lamina papyracea bit. It's going to be clean. 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 It's going So now what we are going to do is we are going to use a J curate and enter into the sphenoid sinus. इतना भी नहीं हल्का सा जे तो यू हैव टू आईडेंटिफाई मैं एक्चुअली ऑलरेडी इन द स्पीनोइड साइनस हियर इफ यू आईडेंटिफाई द मैक्सिलरी साइनस द स्पीनोइड साइनस इज एक्चुअली गोइंग टू बी ऑलवेज बिलो दैट लेवल दैट्स द स्पीनोइड साइनस आई मीन द स्पीनोइड साइनस राइट नाउ let me show you with a straight suction. Wait a second. Yeah, there are forty rod divider. Yes, sir. Do 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 do. Wait a second. Ban karo suction. So what I'm gonna do now? is just clear out this fungal debris from here. There's quite a lot of inflamed, swollen edematous tissue that we see. And once we clear out all that inflamed edematous tissue, Oh. 
जय के रहे जना सर क्या क्वेश्चन ले रहे क्या रेगुलर जे के रेड देना बॉड बैंड है तभी तो था ये That's the front uh, sorry the sinusoid sign is there एक सेकंड सक्षम है ना अतः वो देख सकते हैं तो दैट्स द सीनोइड साइनस दैट वी आर लुकिंग एट सो व्हेन यू आर ओपनिंग अप द सीनोइड साइनस टू थिंग्स दैट यू मस्ट कीप इन माइंड इज ट्राई नॉट टू try not to make a round opening the reason why you shouldn't make a round opening is because that it stenoses quite quickly you know it stenoses very quickly and it sort of closes up it because of the circumferential movement of the mucosa okay so try to keep the mucosal uh, sorry the opening as a square shape so you can see that that is the uh, bleed from the nasal septal branch ये देना देना है है तो पहले तो पीजे ओनली वे आइडेंटिफाई इफ यू एक्चुअली ओपन द वाइड इन इन अ केस लाइक दिस वुड बी टू सी दैट यू शुड हैव ब्लीड फ्रॉम द नेजल सेप्टल ब्रांच ओके सो दिस इज प्रोटी इजी टू कंट्रोल एज यू कैन सी सो दैट इज एक्चुअली द ब्लीडर uh so we've got it under control nahi ye to ye ye nahi hai ye lag raha ye lag raha hai so we're going to use a suction uh, monopolar cautery or you can also use a bipolar cautery uh what the fuck ek second bahut zyada hai ye ha that's it that's enough ek second ek second ek second lag raha hai पानी डालो रेंज रेंज सो दिस इज नथिंग टू वरी अबाउट इट्स अ स्मॉल टाइनी वेसल जस्ट हां सो बस बस दैट्स इट सो वी हैव गॉट दैट अंडर कंट्रोल नाउ पंच देना कौन सा पंच है छोटा देख So what we are trying to do is we are going to open up this whole sinus, Anita. Looks like it's a pretty big sinus. So we're going to try and make as square of an opening as we can. Okay. be very careful when you're doing this maneuver because you don't want to damage either the optic nerve or the carotid artery especially in these cases because they could be dehiscent because of the disease so once you have the fungus sitting there for a long time punch you invariably have dehiscence of these critical structures in fact about 30% of these patients will have dehiscence that's the number that has been reported in literature right now one and all you can see that as we go posteriorly the bone becomes quite thick and osteotic clean karke dena now we got a beautiful picture so you see as and when the fungal debris gets cleared the amount of bleeding will slowly start reducing
Okay, so that's a nice square opening as you can see. So once you have a nice square opening, extending from the base of the, sorry, the skull base, till about the vessel that we saw with, where we had a bleed, that's a good enough opening actually. So function enough for I'm just going to open it a little more superiorly. I've got a beautiful picture now. So all you have to do now is actually trace this skull base superiorly. That's it. In the same time, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to clear off the lamina preparatia as well. So that way, two of my landmarks get very much clear. One is the skull base and the other is the lamina preparatia. So this is the most critical part actually, especially with regards to the optic nerve. So you can see there was a big retromaxillary cell which I'm joining up with the maxillary sinus in order to create a big wide mega androstomy here. This is the widest that I can make it at this point of time. So the retromaxillary cell has been joined. Now we've identified the skull base of the sphenoid sinus here. All we have to do is trace it backwards and we should be able to reach into the frontal sinus. This patient's got a pretty small frontal sinus on this side. So you can already see that we're achieving good amount of control over the bleeding. Nice. You can actually see a vertical shelf, sorry, a horizontal shelf here along the lamina preparatia, which I'm actually taking off right now. What I like to do is I like to fracture this downwards. Be very careful when you're doing that maneuver. You can easily enter the lamina preparatory actually. Take a second, I'll go Blakesley then. Straight through cut again? Through cut again, straight. Okay. Oh, 
ऑटेरस ब्लेड लगाइए ओके वॉश पे ना जोर से So now I'm using a 40 rad blade. I'm trying to remove all of the residual cells along the skull base. I know that this is my the level, the lowest level of my skull base is at uh, the sphenoid. So now I can be bold enough and I can go above the level of sphenoid block. Nahi, bottle. We're gonna try and remove as much fungus as possible as time passes by. ब्लॉक करिए इसको सो यू शुड बी एबल टू सी अ कंटीन्यूअस द होल स्कल बेस कंटीन्यूअसली लाइक अ वाटरफॉल फ्रंटलाइन एक सेकंड सतीश बात को बोले जो करो तो तक आगे नहीं डिटेल में इसका सतीश बात है क्या बोलो मिसेंट्री में क्या एंट्री रेट मोड एक बार चेक करना है स्कैन मिसेंट्री में क्या एंट्री रेट मोड चेक करना है Now we're using the 70 degree scope, and the first thing that I want to do is with the 60 rad blade. I'm just gonna clear off the upper part of the ancinate process here. Then it's tight. Can we do it? So this patient's got a pretty small frontal sinus. So we're not going to be seeing a lot of pneumatization in this frontal sinus. Andrew, it's not mesentery, me, okay, sir? It's probably it. One twenty blade, me. Ah, one twenty, then I'm going. No, but this side, no.
aku record ya gitu. Ini Afton Blackie. Questions kuch aa rahe hai kya sir? Giraffe dena side to side. Side wali. Beta side. आते हैं क्या उनकी आवाज भी सुने So now we're going to use a 120 rad debrider to go straight yeah. into the frontal recess. Because there are 120 is one which gives you opportunity to look into the frontal with a 70 degree. Yeah. With much comfort, you know. Well, there's a question from Dr. Mahesh Rathi. Yeah. How to save the entry for the artery in such bleeding? This is what Gaurav is doing. See, once you are using 70 degree, your trajectory look into the sinuses is different in far anterior. An anterior thermal artery which is running along the skull base at the posterior most part of the anterior thermal roof is far off. That is the beauty. Once you use 70 degrees, you are far away from the trajectory of the anterior thermal artery. Once you are, uh, you know, working anteriorly. So this is what uh, Gaurav is doing. He is working anteriorly, you know. See the beak is in his picture. Yeah, you can see nine. the way to the frontal sinus and the entry point of artery is not so anterior. Now he is, uh, you know, making way into the frontal sinus. See this, the, you have seen the beak taking that septation, going behind it, fracturing it, and then going anteriorly. See, this is how you can safely. And the most important thing is using the blunt instrument. See, this is what uh, we have to remove completely. Uh, the fungus. Fungus for this patient is an antigen. You know, inviting all the problems. Unless and until you don't remove the fungus, he's not going to, you know, Display of the problem. Yeah. Oh my God! There's a big question from Dr. Siddharth from uh, Tanu Tanuku. Let me read it out. To me, so I have come across this subcutaneous swelling lateral to the vestibule recently, which I excise through lateral lanotomy, HP indicated as per granuloma. Has put on X-ray was on his all, but two months later he presented with a swelling lateral to the nasal bone and nasal obstruction. Intranasal is an early reason for the hard swelling. Nasal displays a lot. MRI features suggested entomomyces. Can you share me the experience regarding the fungal region? Dear Siddharth, I tell you one word answer for this problem. See the god of. See the way he has opened the frontal sinus. See, entire mucosa preserved. Entire mucosa preserved. You know, and the frontal sinus and the supra orbital research is very, very obvious. So now, coming back to Dr. Siddharth with this situation, I tell you one word answer. It is Espergiloma and the drug of choice is Voriconazole. Had you given Voriconazole earlier, it would have been subsided by now. As simple as that. 
say still now it has been proven that it is aspergilloma it is chronic invasive fungus start worry for a while and forget about it that's it so the answer is worry for a while till you can start get it check till you can start the thing is once you suspect it is chronic invasive fungus retrocanal all is never an answer it was worry canal all which should have been started that's it so still you start worry canal all and forget about it looking at the scenario what you presented i hope it should be all right the reverse blade there is a very important question from dr mahesh hiralal rathi again uh, i would i must congratulate him for a very very practical question can afrs be diagnosed in opd without the help of radiology to me yes most of the time i can't say 100% the reason being afrs has a characteristic findings endoscopic finding characteristic presentation and characteristic age group where it involves it involves younger people unilateral you know with a fungal material in the us you saw how the gorak showed on endoscopy when he started a case where the fungal material was coming out of the sinus that is a classical picture that classical you know the thick incipient mucin the chocolate butter sauce is a classical of afrs so young patient unilateral female you know with fungal material coming out of it is classical you know on majority of the patient you can diagnose even without radiology so it's a very very practical question i would say yes you cannot be sure 100% all the time but yes in majority of the patient you can uh, diagnose abhi reverse blade use karo wo bhi bol dijiye yes yes that is important see this what garav is doing is using reverse blade keeping the skull base away this is you know the best blade to work along the anteroscopic skull base because your direction of the blade is away from the skull base so this whatever work he has done in the frontal so far is absolutely mucosal preserving see sometimes when there is a difficult frontal situation you have to spend time reassess and then make your plan and then go ahead that is what he has done you can see the frontal sinus very very wide you can see the interfrontal interfrontal sinus cell go up can you show the interfrontal sinus cell yes that is the interfrontal sinus cell i told you it is communicating with the frontal and you can see the communication the frontal was a dependent one once you you know suck down the secretions the mucosa which is looking into that is going to subside so that is a classical example of a, you know a difficult frontal situation with a narrow frontal interfrontal sinus cell with a fungus and polyp in that region and that is how you need to uh, do it yes yeah. we have so many questions you know we have one more question from uh, you know dr girish who made care from delhi nahi sir what is the role of vitamin d as an immunomodulator ha uh, bata bataiye and vitamin d is you know this is a immune complex disease what we know uh, with so much of research you know have been done in last couple of decades so sinusitis is a immuno you know immune complex disease anything which improve the immunity is going to help us and vitamin d is one of them vitamin d exerts its function through several ways it improves the sinonasal immunity in several ways not only that it improves the sensitivity to the corticosteroids so like if i talk other way around patients who are severely deficient with vitamin d in such situation even if you give steroids it is not going to work so in such situations vitamin d is one which is something very very important in allergy fungal sinusitis if i talk about this particular patient if you have a vitamin d level then if they are low and you will see a lot of studies done 
patients having severely you know deficient vitamin d status have more bone erosion as compared to the those who have sufficient vitamin d so vitamin d is important it improves the synovial immunity it improves the microbial flora it improves the mucociliary reaction it uh, you know it has a effect on a lot of cytokines which are implicated in the causation and propagation of crs so by multiple ways vitamin d is something is like a uh, you know master control which is important to be you know taken uh, given due consideration there is a question from uh, girish dr girish you have taken Uh, and there are a lot of questions on cytology. I think uh, Dr. Sara Wais has already, uh, you know, uh, addressed these issues in detail. And uh, uh, one of the most elaborate presentations on workup in sinusitis I have ever seen. I must congratulate Dr. Sara Wais for this amazing informative presentation. Uh, still there are questions oh my god dr gayatri pandit who herself is an authority you know i i know her she is a very very prominent allergic specialist a question is what is specific indication for intradermal test over skin prick allergic test i know whatever i know about it she knows thousand times more about it but still for audience intradermal test is a direct you know uh, penetration into the dermis which is a more chances of you know uh, adverse reactions severe adverse reaction and this is indicated only in those situations reserved for only those situations where you have a high suspicion of allergy and still your skin prick test is uh, you know showing negative and uh, i hope in uh, the coming webinars dr gayatri pandri will come and elaborate more and more on allergy issues gaurav am i correct yeah yeah she is uh this question from uh, shino that from dr uh, mish sajad kadri role of surgery in allergic sinusitis see as your question says allergic sinusitis means it is eosinophilic sinusitis you are talking about and for that eosinophilic sinusitis the thing which works best to prevent eosinophilic recruitment survival maturation is steroid yes super super man watch and for that the only thing which works is a steroid so in allergic sinusitis like your question is uh, you know mentioning we need steroid for the patient but how long we can give oral steroid so those are the classical candidates classical indications for you know uh, sinus surgery so that we can switch over those patients after opening all the sinuses to the topical steroid rather than oral steroid So this is the role of surgery, and this is the major role of surgery in allergic diseases because we don't need to give oral steroids later on. We can penetrate by means of, uh, you know, widely opening the sinuses to make the steroids reaching everywhere in the depth of the sinuses to avoid the need of oral steroids. There's a very important question from uh, Dr. P. Padma Raju. When to add mental lucas in the management of CRS? See, if somebody is asking such a relevant question, is our teacher? Believe me. This is the. What the reason is? Sixty blood level. This question can prevent lot many children using mental lucas, you know, widely. Mental lucas has a role. in crs setting in a very limited indication the and best indication for monte lucas in crs setting is aerd aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease which is basically 
and leukotriene they were doing well abundance of the leukotrienes is a crude version of it when the patient is allergic to aspirin more and more leukotrienes are formed for the arachnoid disease has been prostaglandin and, and leukotrienes are the propagators of inflammation so this montelukart which is leukotriene receptor inhibitor is the best agent as far as medical treatment is concerned for the disease which is not the final answer so as far as medical treatment is concerned montelukart is the best available agent and i must congratulate dr padma rajesh for this question because montelukart should not be used for any other indication in sinusitis besides this this is something we need to know montelukart is not the drug for sinusitis this is for some limited indications you know in aird where it should be used thank you dr padma rajesh sorry A very important question from Dr. Ogonowski from Johannesburg. Thank you for connecting and uh, uh, you know for this interesting query. How long one should give steroids? All steroids. See, this has been discussed, I think, earlier with uh, by Professor P. J. Omol in the last webinar. One twenty. And we have discussed several times. Richard, Richard Harvey. Richard Harvey. oral steroids obviously are the you know the main source of you know relief to the patient when you start oral steroid the symptoms are you know come in control come under control so fast but the basic issue with the oral steroid is the adverse effects how long you can continue there their own you know adverse effects and you can't afford to continue for long So the question is, how long you use oral steroids? You can't for you, you know, for a longer period. In certain countries, there are restrictions for using oral steroids indiscriminately. You know, every time you have to have a full performer to fill using oral steroids, so that the overall annual dose of oral steroids can be limited to the patient to prevent vascular necrosis of the hip, diabetes, peptic ulcer, so many uh, complications. So again, I am coming back to your question: How long you use oral steroids? This is the main, main question. The reason being, you can't use for long, and that is why the sinus surgery is indicated. More than two times a year is an indication for sinus surgery. Yes, like Gora mentioned, more than two times a year, if you need oral steroid to control your sinusitis symptoms, is an indication whether you go ahead with the sinus surgery and allow the topical steroid to penetrate inside. Rather than giving oral steroids again and again, so that is one of the classical indications in those situations. See, indications of the sinusitis you have to redefine yourself. Amazing. See the maximum sinus. See what you have done in a what I call this. My terminology for this is a full house face. Full house face means he has gone to the limits all around, removed all septations. Laterally orbit, you know, all the way supremely skull base, everywhere we put all possible septation to allow the topical steroid to penetrate freely. Now for this patient, we all know for allergy fungal sinusitis, for any allergy situation in the body, for any immune complex disease, steroid is the answer. And for this particular problem, especially. Our main theme post-operatively is going to be the topical steroids, and he has ensured that the topical steroids are going to penetrate freely now with what the kind of surgery he has done. So now the owner has asked to counsel our patient to do it properly with the topical steroids. Now, why I'm calling full out first? Why this terminology is being used? What do you mean by full out? Full out means you have done your job for the life. This patient, all it this patient requires is a topical steroid irrigation. If unfortunately he happens to, you know, discontinue and doesn't irrigate, and the polyp and the fungus happens to come back, and you happen to undertake the sinus surgery again, you know. What all the sinus surgeon is going to do? 
because he has already removed all possible temptations what all you are going to do with your section and divide it to remove the possible fungus which is arisen again and and the you know uh, the polyp which you can divide that's it no bone work is left with so for the future sinus surgeon there is no bone work which is left with that is why we call it as a full house sinus surgery because this kind of a you know a formal sinus surgery has been done forever this this patient will never require a formal sinus surgery in the most you know unfortunate situation where you can't continue with the post op irrigation and all you may develop polyp which you can debride a lot of people debride in their clinic i i learned this from professor sethi from singapore he he does you know little bit of a debride but it is clinic only and you can do it on a nasal spray that's it because we know the pathophysiology of the disease and for that reason we subject all these patients post operatively once everything is healed after a couple of weeks with the skin prick allergic testing and then immunization and majority of the patient what we have found is the alternaria which is the cognitive version that is the fungus which is responsible for this kind of a disease so that is amazing Gaurav, you have a, um, uh, you know, very nice demonstration. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Kripa Moenat. His, his concern is, topical budesonide is said to 30 to 40 percent chances of systemic absorption in some studies. Sir, your concern is obviously uh, valid. But the question is uh, not very specific. The reason being, 30 to 40 percent chances of objection is a different thing, and 30 to 40 percent, you know, uh, objection is a different thing. It definitely it gets absorbed systemically. That's how it affects. That's how it acts. But not 30 to 40 percent. This is too much uh, for the bodhisattva to be absorbed. If Buddhism is absorbed 30 to 40 percent, we can't use for longer. A lot of studies have been done. Gaurav has already mentioned in the beginning today. Five to six percent of the patients have long-term side effects. Five to six percent, that too long term, not short term. So Buddhism is that way is very very safe. Oh, but, uh, six, there's six percent chance that you will develop glaucoma. Yes, yeah. So and you know, patient who's got predisposed to glaucoma. So in the worst six situation, percent. you have six percent chance, and that too you can minimize. And the protocol is obviously these patients require long-term steroid irrigation. But what we do in our practice, we suggest them to irrigation right from day two after surgery for a couple of weeks until everything heals. In the sinus cavities. Once it is healed, the mucosa is good. We keep on reducing the frequency and concentration. If the patient happens to maintain good, even after reducing the frequency and concentration, we uh, you know observe and we further keep on reducing. So you practically can reduce the even the topical dose to the bare minimum possible. Without having systemic side effects, so that is uh, something we uh, avoid you to come across the severe side effects of the night. So, Gaurav, uh, very good comment from Dr. Mahesh Hiralal Rati for your nice demonstration. Ah, uh, there is again a very good question from Dr. Mahesh Rati. Shall we use antifungal drugs in the post or pre-operative period? Mm. Let me tell you, a lot of, you know, this is a very important point of, you know, uh, discussion, a lot of research work has been done, a lot of randomized, non-randomized trial, a lot of, you know, retrospective data. Retrospective, so many things have been done. A lot of studies have been done, a lot of, you know, uh, trials have been done. Antifungals have practically no role in non-invasive fungus, as simple as that. As far as it is non-invasive, antifungals have no role because 
non invasive fungus has given this kind of a situation because of their nature of allergy by the host host is allergic to the fungus and for any allergic reaction the steroid is the answer oh yeah so got okay. amazing demonstration amazing mind blowing thank you so much thank you so much for joining uh, us thanks thank to the audience for their active participation thank you for giving me the opportunity sir thank you so much are you have been doing so good garav and always a pleasure having you in jaipur so i remember my past times and me and garav used to have a you know used to be in heaven heaven <laughs> jugal bandi in study <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank so, you so much. Ramon ji, I think we can call that a day. Are we good to end the session? Would someone from Sun Pharma like to give a word of thanks? Ramon sir, Nishan sir, kindly on your camera. Yes, please do. Is there? Are there? अरे प्रमोद सर गए क्या हेलो प्रमोद सर कैन यू स्पीक सर लव द मीटिंग हां प्रमोद सर गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी सो नाउ वी आर कम टू द एंड ऑफ द सेशन एंड आई टेक दिस प्रिविलेज टू थैंक ईच वन ऑफ यू फॉर सच अ फॉर दिस मेकिंग दिस प्रोग्राम वेरी वेरी सक्सेसफुल एंड इट्स अ मैटर ऑफ ग्रेट प्राइड दैट इवन एज दिस वी आर मोर देन 1000 पार्टिसिपेंट्स आर देयर हु आर एक्टिवली पार्टिसिपेटिंग एंड व्यूइंग दिस लाइव सर्विस इज गोइंग ऑन so i take this opportunity to thank all our panelists all our speakers uh, for making this program very very successful and uh, a global program uh, and a lot of doctors are watching this program thanks for making this uh, program uh, successful and i want to make a special uh, mention to uh, dr satish jain sir for uh, coming all the in making uh, getting associated with this program and uh, uh, increasing the value for this program thank you very much sir and uh, and uh, no program can be successful without their audience and i'm very thankful to all the audience for uh, becoming part of this program and uh, uh, making this uh, ongoing program this uh, uh, this is a series of program is there so uh, make, uh, from last to this is second session and we're going to share the uh, schedule for the third session as well thank you very much thanks a lot and good night thank you very much the announcement for the next session is going to be on uh, we're going to have it on radiology Dr. Satish Jain and I were going to discuss uh, how to read a CT scan. This is going to be very important for postgraduate students and those uh, who want to write exams in the near future, as well as for clinicians who want to understand. We're going to have different scenarios uh, and different clinical conditions uh, and imaging signatures of specific disease uh, uh, entities in rhinology. Uh, there will be a fantastic session. So both of us are going to be tag teaming on imaging of the nose and paranasal sinuses, which is going to happen next Friday. Thank you. Thank you, and big thanks to Sun Pharma. Thank you, thank you, sir. So always, uh, you know, and now is uh, uncounting leading the academic, you know, promoting the academics in India. Thank I think you. so too. Thank Honestly. you, thank you so much. Over to you, Pramod. Thank you.